Morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the February 27, 2018 uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. If you'll please join us in a brief moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any late additions or changes to the agenda? Uh, we do have a number of um, revisions on uh, consent agenda. On number, uh, item number 18, there's a correction. Uh, the item should read, adopt resolution to create the new job classification of senior medical billing technician for the health services agency. Revise the workforce development board director's salary range for the human service department and take related actions as recommended by the interim director of personnel. There's additional materials with that item. There's a revised board memo, and there's also a revised attachment um, packet, page 128. On item number 38, there's an additional material. There's a replacement page, uh, attachment E, pages 508 through 510. On the regular agenda, uh, item number 50, there's a revised board memo, uh, packet pages 629 and 630. And then um, on, uh, there's an agenda, there's a, on the consent agenda, agenda item 43.1, uh, staff requests that this item be deleted. That's item 43.1. 43 that concludes the uh, corrections. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to the consent items. Are there any board members that uh, may be interested in pulling or commenting on item? Good morning, uh, Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, on number 24, I'm not sure how to do this, but uh, uh, we could vote for approval, but I would like to have the uh, uh, Mental Health Advisory Board be put on the agenda to actually talk about uh, all the accomplishments that they've done in the past few years and uh, give them an opportunity to come before the board. Okay, Supervisor, I'll work with you for a future agenda to have that presentation done. That'd we'll work together on that. Sure. Are there any other comments on any other item? Uh, I think that'll be fine. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, good morning. Uh, good morning. On item 21, I want to appreciate Supervisor Coonerty bringing uh, these issues, uh, gun-related issues, to the attention of the board and the action we're going to take. I, I just wanted to think it'd be good for us to uh, make a comment about what our sheriff's office is doing in relation to uh, deputies and so forth that throughout and schools uh, throughout Santa Cruz County. Uh, the sheriff's office has an armed deputy at each of the high schools um, through, uh, during school hours in the county, Soquel, Aptos, and San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and uh, he, uh, the deputies make a continuous stop at, at schools throughout the county on their regular beat. So um, we do have presence on campus uh, uh, with uh, qualified personnel uh, on campus here in Santa Cruz County from the Sheriff's Office, and they are making regular stops at schools throughout the county. And that number is probably into the 30 or 40. I'm not sure how many there are, but I think the, the general public of Santa Cruz County would like to know that under the circumstances of what we, we've uh, experienced in this nation recently. Um, on a lighter note, I'd like to uh, comment on item 37 regarding the co code enforcement priorities and let the record show that none of the priorities are in the 5th district. Uh, <laughs> you know. And um, the, uh, and uh, on item 39, to the um, continuous process improvement efforts related to uh, the review process and customer service in the planning department. I think it's something that uh, we've all heard about, uh, we've all been working on, <coughs> and uh, to Kathy Pervisich and the people in the planning department, I, I want to say thank you for your, your efforts to improve uh, our customer service to the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, just a couple items to comment on. The first is, uh, as Supervisor, Mc or Supervisor McPherson mentioned, is item number 21. Uh, this is calling for the board to both support the remarkable students who are out there right now pushing for sensible uh, gun policy in this country to support a series of measures which um, would be a small step towards making our schools and our communities safer. And then finally is asking uh, to support uh, John, John Chung's uh, efforts to have our investments actually match our values uh, and to not have uh, the, our pension funds invested in, um, in gun companies. And so um, I hope to have my colleagues support and appreciate Supervisor McPherson's support. I have number 28. 28, I want to thank um, Jiang Wen and the and HSA for pursuing uh, a, a grant for crisis services for the youth. Uh, the youth population is underserved in this community, um, and I really appreciate her and her department's efforts to, to bring more resources uh, to, to those folks. On item number 37, which is the code enforcement abatement, um, the third district is still has more work to do to catch up with the pristine fifth <laughs> district. Uh, uh, and uh, so I appreciate the code uh, enforcement actions that were taken um, in the third district uh, and around our county to, re to reduce um, impacts to communities as well as fire dangers and other dangers. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. There's just a couple items I'd like to speak about. Uh, one is on item uh, 16 about the housing navigation policy. I just want to just both commend our staff and but also the housing authority um, who put together a very thoughtful uh, information that helped him better inform me about uh, how the housing authority looks at this and I really appreciate that work and the ongoing work of our housing authority. Thank you for that. Um, on item number 19, I encourage the board support uh, for assembly member Mark Stone's bill um, banning uh, cigarette butts on, on, uh, on our cigarettes. The, the, this is a huge contribution to trash on our beaches and all around. Um, they provide no real uh, health benefit uh, and they may contribute uh, 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 to uh, deeper lung disease. We really need to work to do this and I appreciate uh, the assembly members continued uh, concentration on trying to find a way to build support for a bill like this. On item number 21, I uh, uh, appreciate the uh, efforts of my colleagues and I also want to take this opportunity uh, to let people know that the sheriff's office, along with all law enforcement agencies, are conducting a gun buyback on March 24th uh, from 10 to 2 uh, at the sheriff's uh, office on 5200 Soquel, as well at the Watsonville Fire Station Number 1, which is on 2nd Street in Watsonville. Um, there's a lot of work we could do to keep it away from uh, guns away from schools, but getting guns off the street is really helpful, and I really appreciate the leadership of our law enforcement agencies to help provide a venue for that to happen. Um, uh, I'll look forward uh, to the presentation for the Mental Health Advisory Board here on item number 24. Uh, it was, uh, it was, there was some interesting information about the 7th Avenue facility, and it would be a great opportunity to talk about that more when it comes before the board. And on item number 28, um, the, uh, the critical need for uh, mental health services for young people is, is very clear. We've heard it before this board. I'm really glad to see the leadership that our, our uh, health services agency is taking to apply for these funds and hopefully we'll be successful and be able to expand uh, funding. On item number 36, I'm glad that, that we finally found a way to, to honor the, the board's uh, direction to be part of the Monterey Bay Housing Trust. I think this is just one part of a regional strategy to address the housing crisis in our community and I'm glad uh, to see us moving forward on that. On item number 37, uh, I'm really glad that we are actually using uh, a fund to uh, work on abatements. Um, as was pointed out, the one on Heron Lane, which is going to eat up a lot of uh, the uh, money, 40%, is a real problem and this is uh, to have abatement funds is really critical uh, when um, properties are used for all sorts of activities but then there's no one around to to clean them up after they're uh, after they're despoiled and they cause problems w with the environment and the neighborhoods so i'm glad to see that we finally have some uh, items on here that we're going to fund it and it's going to be a challenge for us all to make sure that there's continued funding for abatement procedures uh, so we can deal with these problems uh, out in the community. And with that, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. I'll just comment on 
two quick things that um, my colleagues hadn't mentioned. Just like to uh, thank the Parks Department for their work on item 33, bringing forward the integrated recreation software system replacement. I know that that's actually going to make uh, a big difference both internally and externally, and it's really a pretty minimal cost for what it'll really provide uh, from a service standpoint. And I'd like to thank Public Works for beginning the process on, on Cox Road with the independent contractor agreement. Uh, I appreciate all the work that you've done expediting the repair projects from the storm damage within our district. I know there's a massive amount throughout the county, uh, but uh, I've heard a lot of good things from people within the 2nd District for the hard work that Public Works has done, and I appreciate that you're continuing to prioritize that. Uh, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on items on consent? Now would be your opportunity. Please feel free to step forward for the consent items. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, Marilyn Garrett. I'd feel more welcome if this wasn't such a microwaved environment with all the Wi-Fi and antennas on the roof with this harmful radiation that makes my tremors even worse. But you sound good when you say welcome. I just, uh, the environment isn't good here. Um, number 17. Uh, county library funds excess of 4.5 million, and I understand it must be used to improve um, the library. My suggestion, this is a serious suggestion, to improve the library is to make it so it doesn't have Wi-Fi microwave radiation harming everyone. Like the National Library in Paris, one of the largest collections in the world did. They went to a wired system. The excess funds could be used to do a wired um, system for computers instead of a uh, wireless microwave system. And I will leave you again with this uh, brochure that says Wi-Fi in the library, convenience or health hazard with some excellent citations here and a picture of the brain, the damage to the brain uh, from exposure to microwave radiation, exposed and unexposed rats. Uh, number 19, eliminate toxic cigarette waste. Uh, the butts, um, that, um, that's it's a, a drop in the bucket. I think what we need to do is eliminate cigarettes and the cigarette industry because it's always there long to pollute the butts, the cigarette smoke. It's going to be everywhere. We're picking up as the corporations um, privatize the profits and they socialize the cost. We, the public, are to pay for the cleanup of their dangers. That's not right. Uh, 43.1, this uh, that was added late. 43.1 has been deleted. Oh, it's been deleted. Okay. That's, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And the last one, number 27, uh, the air patrol uh, under Homeland Security. What I see with Homeland Security is the militarization of the police when there's already excessive amounts of money spent on police and surveillance, and I really don't think, think it benefits the public. So those are my uh, comments and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to address us on consent? Please feel free to step forward. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Franny Cooper. I work for Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. We're a regional nonprofit that uh, works on the econ economic quality of life in the Monterey Bay region. We cover Santa Cruz, Mo Monterey, and San Benito counties. I'm here regarding item 36, just thanking you for your support for the Monterey Bay Housing Trust. We've made huge strides in the last year, partnered with Housing Trust Silicon Valley, who is matching our funds four to one on affordable housing projects for low to very low income income residents throughout the area. And we've already funded three different loans, including the Water Street Project. We have a number of others in the pipeline. And um, your approval of this funding last spring enables us to expand to unincorporated areas of Santa Cruz County. And I just wanted to thank you for your support and your, um, in providing affordable housing in our area. Thank you. Thank you for your work. 
Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, Supervisors, on, uh, on number 21 with the uh, moves to penalize law-abiding citizens and, and disarm people from protecting themselves. We see that uh, Sheriff Israel um, stopped arresting teenagers early this year, and he made it mandatory uh, so that a crime appears that it has never happened. Some of those crimes included concealed weapons, assault and battery, and theft. Uh, it was under a program called Promise, and they are not, uh, these uh, violators and criminals are not uh, listed until their third violation. And we see that uh, there were 39 complaints to his office. I think this attitude of uh, uh, making these people um, out of sight creates a danger to all the rest of the children and to the community. I request that the county maintain records of the violators, especially the violent ones, in the sanctuary cities. And as Bruce McPherson said, it's you know, probably a good idea to have a, a visual presence, presence, but also when that visual presence isn't there, it's a invitation as to strike by these crazy people. I encourage that uh, there be uh, people uh, with concealed carry uh, permits that are well uh, trained and uh, are not afraid or are not hiding behind a car while children are being killed or assassinated. Um, also on the items number 26 and 29 and a couple of other ones, you keep dividing our community into genders and race. I, I get rid of these various uh, committees, treat everybody as an individual equally. And also on 37, um, with your customer service for the planning department, that's your way to cover your crime of abolishing the Citizens Appeals Board. Um, that power grab remains in your hands and it's uh, unseemly that you think that nobody in your county, a contractor, a plumber, a carpenter, you can't find anybody to replace yourselves that make the law, enforce the law, and then decide. You make yourselves a judge. That's outrageous and that's a uh, tactic of uh, the communists and Nazis. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I want to thank you for putting the binder of the documentation that is um, adherent to today's agenda in the back of the room, as has been asked for many times. Thank you. It allows people to read here the documentation rather than having to go down the hall. Thank you. I would like to uh, comment briefly on item number 15, the tax penalty relief. I was happy to see that. I didn't know that uh, citizens can request uh, waivers of penalties, costs, and other charges resulting from property tax delinquency. And I'm glad that 203 people were able to uh, get that relief that gives them four years of uh, relief for tax uh, penalties. Um, I would like to also state um, my, con my thanks to Supervisor Leopold for item number 19 banning the um, plastic filters. I've picked up many of them on the beach and have firsthand seen the effects on wildlife when they ingest them, so thank you for doing that. I would like to comment on item 26, and I will talk about this later during open comment, uh, the Historic Resources Commission report. This commission has a lot of power. They are continually told they have none, and um, it is nearly abysmal what the level of um, oversight is for historic preservation in this county. Office, uh, officials from the State Historic Preservation Office have told me anonymously their office considers Santa Cruz County a black hole of historic preservation, and I would really like to see that change, as I'm sure you would too. And um, I have some ideas for that that I will discuss later. Item number 39, um, actually let me go back to item number 28. Thank you for funding the peer, uh, the youth, mental health advisory, having just attended a funeral service for a 15-year-old suicide victim. I really think that's money well spent and would like the health service agency to also consider increase in peer review. My daughter has felt that that has been much more helpful than talking with an adult. 
Item number 39, um, I would like to ask that in the planning department surveys of efficient use that water agencies be attached to the route checkoff list for plan uh, building permits. Number 42, I think this is a conflict of interest with Mr. Kittleson's wife working in environmental health overseeing wildlife and environmental habitat restoration. And number 43, I do not understand why Bowman and Williams is being given a contract for $55,000 for Cox Road when the county has already contracted with five outside um, engineering consulting firms for storm repair at a cost of $25 million. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to address this during, or, uh, during uh, consent? Or an item on the consent yeah, agenda. Good morning. morning. I want to be able to say uh, to the chair, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Friend, thank you so much for bringing the light item package that has all the reports and also the addendums that we're able to circumspect that and peruse it. I want to be able to say that's great leadership that we do appreciate. Thank you for making that concession. Um, also, I want to just be able to comment on on on, on the on the consent calendar, uh, line item number 13, I was able, now that you guys, the package right there, I was able to peruse that. And, and the report, I, I was just concerned, they had some um, some issues that I was just concerned about. Uh, and, and when it stands with the leadership there, I wanna be able to share with members of the public that I did peruse that. I'm a little dubious about the, the language in there, about the leadership, right? They, they wanna put this commission together, but when it comes to Emily Timberlake, I had a meeting just the other day. I brought my GoPro, which is right here, right? According to the Brown Act, I want to be able to have this meeting because every time I'm there trying to keep these political agencies accountable, they want to vulgarize my activism that I'm up to no good because I'm the usual suspect. But I, I would say I would say this before we go. I, I just I do appreciate that. I know that I'm I'm not dealing with a light item it, itself. I'm just talking about the leadership that they need to be a little bit more sensitive. Okay. To the American public. That's, an, that's yeah, fine. That's an oral communications thing, thank not a consent thank thing. But is there anybody else who'd like to address this in, in uh, consent, please? Good morning. Good morning, Brenda Chadwick. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to comment this morning. I actually wasn't um, planning on commenting on anything on the agenda, but I do want to thank Supervisor Coonerty for item number 21. Uh, that's something that I um, really support. I'm sure. The vast majority of parents support. I can't imagine that um, many in Santa Cruz County don't support it. Uh, I was a secretary for a high school principal for many years. We had resource officers in our school. Uh, the kids knew them. Uh, they were a valuable asset to uh, help recognize uh, when there were problems in the school. And I also like to thank the um, law enforcement in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I know the sheriff's office participated in the 21st century policing, uh, which I attended that uh, session and was thrilled to hear about it. I know the Santa Cruz Police Department is working very hard and we appreciate their efforts and we don't need to have more guns. We need less guns and especially assault guns. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on consent? Uh, good morning, Supervisors. My name is Peter Patu, and I'm involved with the Santa Cruz Hostel Project. I'm addressing the item number 36, where you're paying $200,000 uh, for the housing, housing uh, in, in, in the county. It seems to me that uh, one of the things that's missing is a youth hostel in this county, and another, a second one, we have one hostel in Santa Cruz up on Main Street, up on uh, top Beach Hill, and it's very successful. Uh, we, uh, the problem is it's too small, so in the summertime, we're inundated with uh, a lot of travelers from all over the area, uh, from uh, Central, uh, Central California, f f international travelers, and they can't find any space. Uh, the only limited options uh, for people to stay. A lot of them end up uh, going to the, staying at the beaches or uh, with other homeless people. So it seems to me that the county should uh, endeavor to have uh, a, a second hostel somewhere in the county. And uh, maybe uh, the $200,000 that's available that they seems to want to spend um, could be spent in that direction to find some place uh, that's uh, uh, that's uh, viable as a hostel and is self-supporting. Thank you much. 
Thank you. Anybody else on consent? Uh, real quickly, if there's nobody else. Okay. Well, we do have one other person. Is there anybody else who would like to address this on consent beyond this individual? All right, this will be the last speaker on consent. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kalei Kim, and I just uh, want to express my um, support and happiness of the board's support for the Never Again movement in March for Our Lives because uh, there's no reason for us to have these type of weapons available that are modeled off the, after the M6 and M16. Um, these weapons have been used in numerous uh, mass shootings recently. I also uh, want to uh, voice my support for the funding um, and resolution authorizing the Health Services Agency in item 28 to submit an application for grant funding for the California Mental Health Services Oversight. I think uh, it takes a myriad of support uh, for uh, people in crisis or who have suffered trauma and abuse. Majority of mass shooters do not have mental illness, but in some cases and they do, but even for those uh, who don't go on to um, take violent uh, action, um, we do want to support people in uh, the hardships that they suffer and face. Um, I'm glad that um, this county is leading the way in um, numerous progressive, um, progressive actions and <laughs> we can do more. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. I'll bring it back to the board for action on consent. Real quick comment, and then uh, item 20, I neglected to mention, I, I'd like to welcome Lucy Bassor to the Women's Commission representing District 4. Thank you. Thank you. I move approval of the consent agenda. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. You have three minutes. Good morning. Good welcome. morning, uh, Chair Friend, members of the Board, uh, staff, and members of the public. My name is Alan Smith. I am the uh, this year's Chair of the Creo College Governing Board, and I'm here in that capacity. I'm here to introduce Dr. Matt Wetstein. Matt is a uh, uh, been at work here at Cabrillo for since I think February 1st, so he's brand new. He comes to us from Stockton, where he has been the uh, vice president at Delta College for the last 20 years. He grew up in Illinois. He got his PhD, or actually his undergraduate degrees in journalism, I believe, and his PhD has in political science from the from the Northern Illinois University. And uh, I'm going to let Matt come up and uh, introduce himself from here on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you, um, Chair Friend and Board Supervisors. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, the Board's selection of me uh, really was a thrill to join this community, to join Cabrillo College. Has uh, just been exciting. And everywhere I go in the county meeting folks, it's just been a um, wonderful reception, uh, a great community to join. Cabrillo uh, obviously has some deep partnerships with county government and uh, some deep partnerships with folks on the board themselves. I know some of you have uh, served on the board and or, and or taking courses or are taking courses at the college or have family members who've done so and I'm appreciative of that, that service and, and supporting our college. Uh, I pledge to work as hard as I can with county agencies to help um, improve uh, any kind of workforce uh, improvement and development of our students to be great um, taxpaying citizens and people who get into living wage jobs. Um, appreciate the support that we get from the county and, and county staff, uh, the sheriff's office, which has a, a, a location on our campus as well. We're, we're very appreciative of that safety support that we get from the county. A little bit of background on me before I, I end my speechifying with you. Um, I served on the Stockton Civil Service Commission when I was uh, working in Stockton uh, as a kind of volunteer commitment and have a great appreciation for the work that planning officials do and civil service commissions and, and county staff, city staff. So I want to commend you and your agencies for all the great work you do for the county and its citizens. And um, I make a pledge to you, I'm going to do everything I can to help Cabrillo College help you and improve our workforce and, and get folks trained for a good career. So thank you for the welcome and I hope to see you around the community. Thank you, thank welcome. You welcome. Good morning, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, the county and your board has done a good job of developing and passing an ordinance for local cannabis dispensaries to compete in the regulated market. 
Thank you. But you are failing the small farm cultivators. Uh, there is an emphasis in the proposed ordinance on larger cultivation sites and basically complete elimination of the smaller farmers. In fact, the state's smaller specialty and cottage license types are not even included in the proposed ordinance. I recently attended board meetings regarding hosted rentals in the county. Most commenters were seniors supplementing their incomes. You voted for a $250 cap and grandfathering in everyone who registers, even if that reached uh, 800, as long as they were paying their TOT tax. All for about $150 registration fee, good for five years. No license fee, no inspection, no inspection fees. Hosted rental providers use the re their residents to carry on commercial activities, just as many artists, writers, realtors, attorneys, tech startups, crafters, beauticians, child and senior care providers, cottage food businesses, etc., do under the county's home occupation ordinance. The county says they are not treating cannabis any differently than any other business, but just think. If there are 800 hosted rentals, each being rented to a party of two for an average of just 100 days of year, that's 160,000 cars driving to and from Santa Cruz and 160,000 strangers coming into our neighborhoods. I'm a senior, I'm a woman, I'm honest and ethical, and I am su supplementing my income in order to stay in my home. I am one person living where I work with no employees. It is safe and secure with no smells, sounds, or lights perceivable from my home. Electrical is up to code. Soquel Creek Water says I'm average in, compared to my neighbors in water usage. How is this more unsafe or environmentally perilous for a neighborhood than a hosted rental? I am advocating for sensible cannabis ordinances that includes the small long-term heritage cannabis farmers in the county. We paid our $500 registration fee and we are paying our taxes. We live where we cultivate safely and responsibly using best practices and the knowledge and experience that produces safe, high quality, environmentally friendly cannabis. We need to be in alignment with the state's license types and definitions with lower scalable fees for these smaller license types. Dispensaries have recently reported that they are having difficulty sourcing local cannabis. We support locally sourced organic food and locally owned businesses. We should be striving to support locally at every opportunity. I say keep it small, keep it local. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, board members. I'm, my name is Veronica Lopez Duran. I'm the Community Studies Program Manager at UCSC, and I'm back today because tomorrow is Giving Day. I left uh, some postcards and sent you all an email uh, yesterday regarding this event. In particular, uh, Giving Day is we, for us, it's going to be an effort to honor Officer Elizabeth Butler um, in seeking to endow a scholarship in her name to support community studies students who are in the program that I work for, who follow in her footsteps by pursuing field study in Santa Cruz County. We also have a generous donor who has agreed to match donations up to $10,000. And so this will allow us to, um, or allow any of you and anybody in the community who contributes to be able to double their contribution. The easiest way to find our campaign information would be to go to communitystudies.ucsc.edu. So that's the best and quickest way to get to us, although I've shared the links with all all of you also you can share on your social media pages. Um, last year alone, community studies students contributed over 7,000 hours to local organizations in Santa Cruz County. Our program is gonna be going on its 50th year next year, so I would like to think that we've been a good part of contributing to um, organizations here in Santa Cruz that are trying to uh, bring social justice issues to the forefront and to provide direct service to folks in our community. Community. So I invite you once again to please share our campaign and any donation in the amount of $5 and up is greatly appreciated because it is not just about the total amount of money that's brought in 
towards the endowment, but it's also about how many people contribute. So if you can contribute $5, then you can be part of this campaign. And there are challenge funds available to us based on the number of people that are contributing. So $5 alone can make a difference in our campaign. Once again, folks should direct um, themselves to the webpage, communitystudies.ucsc.edu, and I thank you for the direct support since that, that is the best way to really get the word out there is to hear from people that you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, I've brought up several times before that um, encouraging the sheriff uh, to investigate several uh, supervisors that called and shut down a free speech meeting that was scheduled and there was uh, violence and intimidation in those uh, uh, those threats and um, it's interesting that the uh, sheriff that would be um, pursuing this is a recipient of campaign donations uh, from four of the people uh, sitting at the Board of Supervisors, and I believe they did the trick of having the previous sheriff uh, resign so that the incumbent, uh, they could appoint uh, this incumbent and uh, make sure that their backsides are covered through the political machine operations that you may maintain. Um, some of the truth I've been uh, putting forth uh, was called hate speech by a local member in the community. And they said there's a big difference between communist with a small C and a big C. So let me get to the big C's here. Uh, a big C communist is one like Hugh DeLacy, whose plaque is outside the, uh, uh, the courthouse uh, steps. And according to the government, it says he devoted virtually all of his time to the operation of communist front operations and spreading communist uh, propaganda. Uh, this communist uh, that's associated with four spy rings um, was uh, featured at the Loudon Nelson Center. The people that showed up and signed off as comrades themselves uh, was Patton, Panetta, Rotkin. Uh, they expressed their love, appreciation, and solidarity uh, to this communist. Also there was Dan Bessie, whose father, again, according to the government says, is among a very accurate list whose uh, purpose is set up to, uh, is to set up espionage system helping the Soviet Union. I know nationally everybody's looking for communist collusion. We have it here in spades. Um, uh, Alva Bessie, together with Hugh DeLacy, were uh, wanting to keep America out of the Second World War because of the Hitler-Stalin pact. This SOB out there, the U Honor, uh, supported both Hitler and, and Lenin and Stalin. I mean, th this is an insult to anybody that knows history and the history of this particular county. Uh, the ACLU, I've got 10 seconds left. Uh, Roger Baldwin says, uh, when we achieve, when we achieve power, I am for maintaining it by any means whatsoever. Communism is the goal. And that's why the ACLU has supported and endorsed Thank you people. By the way, uh, Bruce you. McPherson received Mr. Richard, thousands Mr. Arnold, of dollars from a triple communist red Chinese Please. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Nell Griscom. I'm the president of the Santa Cruz County chapter of the California Grand Jurors Association. And I would like to thank the board for making February Civil Grand Jury Awareness Month. Um, this is the time of year when the grand jury takes applications from the public to be on next year's grand jury. And for those who don't know, the civil grand jury in Santa Cruz County is an independent body that uh, investigates the government within Santa Cruz County. Um, for those who are interested, applications can be found and information on both the county and the court uh, websites. Uh, the proclamation by the board will help us increase the visibility of the grand jury and the application process, and I hope will increase both the size of the applicant pool and the diversity of the applicant pool. I know that Supervisor Leopold has uh, put 
information about the application process on his uh, website and in his newsletter, and I would encourage the other board members to do so as well, publicize it as much as possible, especially the fourth district, um, in hopes that we uh, can get a more diverse group and a, a better population from which to choose the grand jury. Thank you again to the board. Thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Miley Ernest. I'm the 180-2020 initiative director, and I just wanted to come before you because I haven't been up here in a while and give you a brief update. Um, since our, my last update, we are close to housing 700 homeless families and individuals through our collaborative efforts. We're, we've just placed the 685th person or family last week. Um, among other things, 180-2020 has been working closely with Smart Path Coordinated Entry to ensure that we are helping those who are the most vulnerable in our community, community and they're being prioritized. Um, I'm also part of the All-In Landlord Executive Committee um, and if you may, you may have heard, we've um, been trying to increase access to housing across to the, the board in our community. Um, among our efforts, we have created the Landlord Incentive Program with the Housing Authority and have formed the newly um, minted Housing Navigation Collaborative. So I wanted to thank you for your continuous support in our goal of ending homelessness in our community. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning again, Becky Steinbrunner. I would just like to uh, follow up on the previous speaker's comment. The uh, 10 affordable Measure J units in the Aptos Village project are coming up for uh, sale, and I want to make sure that people know there is a workshop tomorrow, February 28th, at the Rio Sands Motel in Aptos, 6 to 7 for English speakers, p.m., 6 to 7 p.m., and 7 to 8 p.m. for Spanish speakers and that will be uh, repeated again on March 24th from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 again for English and Spanish speakers so that's uh, for, the, for some affordable housing coming up that's a good thing for Measure J. I'd also like to comment a bit about the speaker from uh, the civil grand jury I did apply as did a number of uh, people I know who are very interested in trying to make a positive difference in our county and went to the orientation the process is rather a false one I'm sorry to say um, because people who uh, apply are not given any priority at all in terms of being on the grand jury selection process. It's a completely random project, uh, selection, and we were told that it was purely a cost-saving measure for the county that this is being offered for application because there has to be a certain number of people that uh, apply before they can close the application process. So it was a, it was a cost-saving measure. I think it's a good idea to let let people apply, but I think that those people should be given priority, not just a random selection process as a cost-saving measure. I would like to now talk with you about what I really wanted to talk with you about is the, um, I went to the, I had the honor of going to the Monterey County Board of Supervisors meeting recently when they issued the formal apology to the Japanese American citizens in that county for what happened in 1943. A letter of protest was sent out by the board at that time opposing release of Japanese American citizens back into society. And uh, it was quite an honor to be there to see that rectified. I want to let you and the public know that there was quite a different story in the Pajaro Valley. What happened is that uh, Japanese American citizens lost their homes and farms because their assets, their bank accounts were seized within hours after the Pearl Harbor bombing and they had no money to pay taxes. In Pajaro Valley, the people joined together and paid the Hirohara family's taxes and allowed them to keep their farm. This place is now on the historic registry. The barn in which the Hirohara family allowed families who were not as fortunate as them to come back and get their feet under them is in disrepair and needs to be rebuilt to keep the story alive. I'm asking you to uh, request the Historic Resources Commission not thank to you. take this off the National Historic thank Registry. You. Thank you. Thank you, and thank, and thank you for promoting the Aptos Village affordable units. Those are good. I'm happy thank to you. have affordable housing in the county. Good morning, welcome. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Jenny Gomez from Felton. Um, you might remember me from the no shoot zone. Um, Thank you very much again for that. It's made a difference in our community. Um, I'm here today again to talk about the guns in our community and the no shoot ordinance by the county in a more programmatic way. Um, I wanna play this recording for you. Um, this was recorded uh, a little over a week ago in a residential area in Boulder Creek. Um, you can hear it's, it's semi-automatic. Um, it could be an AR-15. Um, it was taken between, and, and there's more, it went on for a while. It was taken uh, between 10.30 at night and 11 p.m. Nobody can see a target at these areas at this, you know, time of day. Um, you know, and our, our no-shoot ordinance doesn't include any restrictions for daytime or nighttime. Um, it doesn't include any restrictions for a type of, you know, guns that can be fired. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot more areas in the county that are like Lompico that are really fairly densely populated residential areas um, where this kind of thing just doesn't belong. And I think for somebody to be out in the middle of the night doing this type of thing, it shows, um, you know, some lack of good judgment. Um, you know, is this the next school shooter? Um, my daughter goes to San Lorenzo Elementary and she's been on two actual lockdowns. These are not drills. Um, she's in second grade. So um, I would just like to urge the county, you know, you have all the resources and everything available to look at where people are shooting their guns and just you know, establish a minimum size of parcel, uh, residential density. I mean, you could look at this in, in a better way and I mean, at bare minimum, you know, look at, maybe people shouldn't be doing this at night. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for coming forward. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name's Tim Tonsing. I live in Lompico. I live in Bruce McPherson's district. I wanna speak in opposition to industrial cultivation of marijuana, especially in the mountains. I think it belongs only in the Paro Valley for so many reasons from rodent side to illegal water diversions, which will make fish go extinct, to the secondary kills of rodent sides. The other course is fire. When I walked in here, the picture that you see there is the Loma fire that was started from a greenhouse that had shoddy electrical service that burned several structures and a couple of houses. Um, my experience with it is I've been shot at by hiking out in the mountains twice. I've seen a gun on a tripwire. It took me a year and a half to get this individual out of my neighborhood that was growing illegally in a place called Happy Land. I really suggest that the supervisors here read uh, Silent Poison. It was a study done by Calaveras Supervisor Dennis Miller of Calaveras County. And after his study, and they had legalized uh, industrial cultivation in their county last year. And after just one year with all the negative situations that arise from poisoning of surface water to rodent sides to increased crime to the uh, change of the makeup of their demographics of their county. They banned it after just one year. Other supervisors in other adjoining counties in the foothills, after they read the report, they have also banned it in their counties too. There are only 11 counties in California that allow industrial cultivation. I don't think it belongs in the Santa Cruz Mountains due to the fire potential. If there's a fire, by God, there's gonna be a lot of houses. Hopefully nobody gets hurt or killed, but anyone knows that if there is an emergency and a wind-driven fire in the San Lorenzo Valley, Highway 9 is not going to be able to handle the traffic. There's no evacuation plan for the San Lorenzo Valley at this time. Also, the fact of the matter is they, the planning department with the dope growers is planning on decreasing the size of what's allowed in RA, residential agriculture, from five acres to one acre. I live in residential agriculture, one acre sites. 
that would allow a greenhouse up to 2,400 square feet, which is three times the size of my house. Um, I really am against it due to if the fire starts in a greenhouse, there's a lot of places in the mountains where the fire department can't make it, like the Bear Creek fire. If it happens in Watsonville in a greenhouse, the fire department will be there in a couple minutes, and the worst thing that happen is a couple greenhouses on each side will burn down, not the forest, people's houses, their livelihoods, their safety, the poisoning of the animals, and the illegal water diversions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, was here, I don't know how many years ago, I'm happy to be here. Some of you know me, I'm Richard Lewis. I operate as a Grupo Amistad Vision. I'll try to get all of you this letter from Susan. I appreciate what Carlos is doing with Vision Santa Cruz County. I'm gonna quote what she said. This is back in 1985. I am a great panther, as you know, some of you, you're passing on your wisdom to the next generation. I didn't plan to get up here, but I know most of you, Ryan knows that he's a teacher. Activism 101. John has the potential to do something as all of you. So I want to just share what Susan said, and then I'll get that letter uh, copies to each of you. And on a historical note, it may interest you to know that a youth commission was formed in 1975 by the Board of Supervisors. Unfortunately, due to the lack of membership and interest of both adults and youth, the commission was abolished in 1982. I can't transfer to you, but we have the sheriff over here. Just do a search on fight crime and best in kids. Check out that of uh, Cabrillo being part of 114 institutions. Go to Student Senate, CCC, and know that I'm counting on your own vision of what's going to be in the process. I only came here because I was told that on the agenda today is a report on Vision Santa Cruz. But what I do want to share is that with possibilities, we never have had a youth city council under the umbrella of the process. Only a nonprofit foundation created now, not in Watsonville, Greg, not in Santa Cruz. So if you'll invest just your own research, I believe that listen to the future can create jobs both county and city. And if I do right, we'll have as quarterback Ted Burke, a little different than Richard Lewis, who I shared, Zach, if you remember, what is the county doing on co-ops? If we can find people who will invest in the idea of a youth co-op, you're all there to make it come to be. So I'm gonna sit back uh, with the possibility that this letter back in 85 will trigger you and your asset as leaders to take a look at what could be not only a countywide structure, whether it's a youth commission, like back in those days, and make sure it has the power of process. So I hope in the next steps, if indeed there'll be a presentation of uh, today, Vision Santa Cruz, that you as leaders will look at how we can empower the next generation. So thank you very thank much. You. I don't understand all of this, but uh, I do thank what you. I can at 81 years young to invest what great Panthers were. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Is there anybody else like to address us in oral communications? This is for items that are not on today's agenda. Okay. I thought I was the oldest one in the room. He's got a few years on me. Anyway, I really want to encourage other people to come and speak to the board in person because it has a great deal of impact and very educational for members of the public as well as you. And just hearing the woman play the sound of the gunshots was very chilling that she recorded in Boulder Creek. This is another type of getting sh shot up. This is my acousticom meter. Uh, electrosmog detector from microwave radiation. This is a sound. 
of the frequencies were being shot up with, basically, causing cellular stress and damage, um, DNA strand break, um, blood cell abnormalities, and the list goes on, and the World Health Organization has categorized this type of radiation as a possible carcinogen. However, there's a new report that says cell phone and cordless form use causes brain cancer, and it's definitely carcinogenic. I'm going to leave you with a copy of this, and that the 5G technology that is being imposed on us across the country is going to increase that radio frequency microwave radiation and damage considerably more. And just to read you a little bit from a conference on, from a 5G international conference on wireless radiation and human health, it was held at Hebrew University Medical School in 2017. 5G and the Internet of Things will cause even greater biological harm. Some have dubbed plans for a new network of extremely high millimeter wave 5G small cell antennas as smart meters on steroids. There is no doubt that the telecom industry's plans for 5G deployment on top of the existing 4G towers and smart meter microwave radiation represent the single biggest threat to our society, health, privacy, and cybersecurity since smart read deployment began. Millimeter waves are utilized by the U.S. Army in crowd dispersal guns, weapons called the active denial systems. Um, I gave you uh, one of your earlier meetings recently, the 5G appeal of scientists Thank you. Um, Thank you. that I would hope people in this county Thank sign you. on to. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else for oral communications? Good morning. Sorry about that. Good morning, uh, Santa Cruz County residents. I want to be able to remind members of the public what it is to be a good flag-waving flag Americans because we are good people. I believe that. I know that we're good people. And this is a great political system. I want to be able to share with members of the public real quick my latest books that I'm reading. Uh, these are really good books, have a plethora of wonderful information that would just illuminate members of the public. It's Democracies and Chains, the deep history of, I would say, ruling class ideology, stealth plan for America. So it's a really great book. Uh, and also I'm reading On Tyranny, uh, 20 Lessons from the uh, 21st Century. Really great book. It just kind of goes with the signs of the time. Um, you know, as, as I come, as I come in here tr trying to stand up for community justice, because I notice that when I'm exercising my First Amendment rights, whether it's at Scotts Valley Library, right, utilizing the services there, or whether it's at the GA office keeping these political agencies accountable to the social debasement policies that they're imposing on the American public. You know, I'm, I'm going through, these, uh, through this malicious prosecution with the DA's office, and I want to be able to share with members of the public, because there's a popular apprehension among the quotidian masses, among people that just don't come from a family of wild power and influence, that the legal community is corrupting our common life. They're using this institution for nefarious means, and they're not coming at it right. We got a DA office that just out of touch with the reality. And they want to consolidate two, two First Amendment rights, which now they criminalize as as disturbing the peace and resisting arrest when law enforcement show their cognitive incompetency by not knowing how to come at situations right. So they consolidated two uh, legal matters because they really have no case. So the, and now we go from a criminal court to harassment court where they want to use the, the public law to control and modify the behavior of the character rather than promote community justice. I would say that the DA, listen, you know, 
we have to understand what justice is, man, if we're gonna make this work. Because the American public, listen, we can disengage from the healing illusions of the community. Because this is all it is. You know, we want community justice where they're gonna come at it right, man. There ain't no cases here, and I shouldn't have to be going through this Mickey Mouse counting go around BS. Listen, if I did something wrong, let's, do, let's come at it right. I wanna let members of the public know that my public defender was not even defending my rights. He was acting as a surrogate prosecutor. Now I'm going pro per, because the legal community has failed the American public. And are we gonna continue with this malicious prosecution? Are we gonna have political bosses that are gonna say, hey, for that guy, you better really scrutinize it, because he's coming in here and he's, and he's pushing up on us, Thank and you, we don't wanna be shaming people out of a job. Thank you. Does anybody else would like to address us in oral communications? Ms. Steinbrenner, you've already addressed this in oral communications. Yes, I realize yeah, that. Then I wonder, Mr. McPherson, would you please announce no, the lesson learned from the Ms. Bear Creek please. fire that happened? Ms. Steinbrenner, please. Thank, Thank you. you. It's, it's Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you very much. Yes, but if you continue, it'll be a disturbing of the meeting, so please oh, do stop. Uh, is there anybody else who'd like to address us during oral communications? Uh, seeing none, we'll close oral communications and go on to our regularly scheduled agenda. The first item we have on our regularly scheduled agenda is item 45, which is a public hearing to consider the creation of a new zone of benefit, Blue Mountain Ridge within County Service Area 23, Old Ranch Road, and upon conclusion, consider adoption of a resolution establishing the new zone as recommended by the Director of Public Works. We have the resolution for Blue Mountain Ridge and the map, and I believe we have a staff report. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. Um, this is a simple matter in that we have an existing county service area number 23 labeled All Ranch Road and four properties within that county service area would like to form a subzone called Blue Mountain Ridge and as you will see in the next item, they choose to assess themselves an additional amount in order to um, improve their road which is um, being funded partially by FEMA but they will have to fund some portions of the repairs themselves. Um, three of the four property owners are here today. If you have any questions, they're in support of the creation of the zone and of the assessment, which is the next item. So I would ask you to please open the public hearing, see if there's any testimony, objections, or protests um, for the creation of the new zone. At this point, we're not addressing the assessment. And then close the public hearing and, if appropriate, um, adopt a resolution. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any questions from board members before we open the public hearing? I uh, see none. We'll now open the public hearing. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us specifically on this item 45 during the public hearing. Is there any members of, members of the community that would like to address us on uh, the creation of the new zone of benefit Blue Mountain Ridge? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for consideration. I'll move to approve. We have a motion from Supervisor Kath and a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now we'll move on to item 46, which is a public hearing to consider the new or increased rate assessment for zone uh, the Blue Mountain Ridge with county, within County Service Area 23 Old Ranch Road for road maintenance and operations and consider related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of Public Works. We have the resolution for CSA 23 and a proposed rate uh, for zone Blue Mountain Ridge. Presentation on this. Good morning. Um, Please, if you would open the public hearing and hear um, objections or protests regarding a special assessment that these four properties um, wish to impose upon themselves um, in order to fund the maintenance and ongoing um, payments that they will need to make on their road um, to complete the repairs. We, um, you would need to, during this public hearing, request a submittal of all ballots, um, if any are outstanding, um, at which time we will then temporarily, um, we will close the the public testimony part of the public hearing, go off to count the ballots and come back later today with the ballot count. Considering that there's four ballots, I would request that we come back after the next item with the results as the property owners wish to stay here until the results are announced. Um, again, this is um, a self-assessment that the properties wish to impose upon themselves. There's four properties. They're not weighted by property size because they all utilize the road in the same way. So um, again, three of the four property owners are here and they would like to stay for the announcement of the results. If you would open the public hearing and request ballots, I would appreciate it. Are there any questions from supervisors on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll now open the public hearing specifically on the rate assessment. Is there anybody in the community who'd like to address us during this public hearing? 
Uh, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Is the motion then to just continue this public hearing until after the following item? Is that an action item that we'll have to take to just continue this item until further in the meeting? Yes, please. So is there a motion to continue so this? All right. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. We'll just continue this item until after item 47, which is our uh, immediate item. By the way, after we take that item, after 47 and this continued public hearing, the board will take about a 15-minute break, just so the community is aware of that. All those in favor for the continued public hearing? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for your patience this morning. Now we'll move on I to- I have an idea how that election is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll move on to item 47. This is to consider a report report on a tiered fee structure for the alcohol nuisance abatement ordinance to schedule a public hearing for March 13th, 2018 uh, at 9 a.m. or thereafter to consider changes to the 17-18 unified fee schedule and direct the clerk of the board to take related actions as outlined in the memo of the sheriff corner and uh, county administrative officer. We have a notice of the public hearing and unified fee schedule alcohol fees. Is there a presentation? Please feel free to step forward. Chief, do you want to be up here? Is that an acceptable location? Oh, this is fine. Thank you, Supervisor. Good morning, Supervisors. When we uh, mass last uh, appeared on this matter in December of last year, the board uh, directed the county administrative officer and sheriff's office to work together to come up with a multi-tiered structure to uh, fund the alcohol nuisance abatement ordinance and to um, use as little general funds as possible to, to perform that. So um, we did meet with the county administrative office and staff uh, as well as the sheriff's office staff, and we uh, came up with a a uh, tier structure that essentially is very similar to the city of Santa Cruz's, um, in the sense that it uh, has three areas that contribute to the fee structure, one being uh, the risk associated with the outlet, the hours of the outlet, and the uh, gross volume sales of the outlet. Um, the fourth and final factor in determining the fee structure is a 15% administrative fee to assist in running the program, which has uh, many features to it. So we're pleased to come up with a fee structure that uh, met the board's um, concerns and suggestions, and um, um, I'd like to recommend that, we, that you consider it uh, for adoption today. Thank you, Chief. Are there questions from board members on this item? I just had a... Supervisor Leopold, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't necessarily have uh, questions. I appreciate the work that our uh, sheriff's office, our CAO's office did in trying to um, uh, replicate the, a similar structure as uh, proposed by um, board members and uh, while, while keeping the bulk of this program. It's uh, incredibly important um, as we look to address the problems that are created by alcohol in our community um, and using a model that has been used in other places uh, and proven to be successful, I'm, I'm glad that we, we might be moving forward with this. So I thank you for your work. Thank you, Sir Ryder. Thank you. Yeah, I just like to repeat that. This is uh, indeed, I appreciate the efforts that are made by the CAO's office and the sheriff. And uh, this is a, it's a, a public safety issue. There's no question about it. I'm glad that we came to a conclusion that's uh, agreeable to all. And I appreciate and like to make the motion that we, well, I guess you want to go to a public hearing first. Thank you. Uh so we're going to open it up to the community now to comment on this item. This is not a public hearing and we're not actually setting the fees. This is just considering the report, providing direction, and then setting a hearing date of March 13th specifically for the fees. <laughs> is there anybody from the community that would like to address us uh, on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for any additional direction or a motion. I'd like to move the recommended action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor uh, Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Were you able to count to four? <laughs> What I meant to say is we're now going to reopen, uh, go back to item 46, which is the continued public hearing of uh, the newer increased rate assessment for Zone Blue Mountain Ridge within CSA 23 Old Ranch Road. We had a ballot count, and the results are? It passed. Um, so because we only received three votes, and all three votes were a yes, it passed by 100 percent rather than 75 percent. So it's 100 percent approval um, by the residents. And we need to now take an, an action to accept those ballots, correct? And adopt a resolution. Uh, do we need to go back to the community for additional comment on this? No? The okay. Is there, testimony is closed. Is there a motion then to uh, accept the ballots? Uh, results. Move, move we accept the ballots. Second. 
We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. The board will take about a 15 minute break and then come back for item 48 regarding the peg fees. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. would like to reconvene the Board of Supervisors and hear item 48, which is to consider proposed ordinance adding section 5.26040 to the Santa Cruz County Code to reauthorize and preserve the county's right to continue to collect peg fees under state law. As outlined in the memo of the Director of Information Services, we have the ordinance amending chapter 5.26 of the county code, and we have a presentation from our director, Mr. Bowling. Good morning, Mr. Bowling, and welcome. Good morning. <laughs> um, as you all know, 2014, we did the DIVCO ordinance as we lost our um, cable franchises. Um, there was the, we were contacted by Charter a couple of weeks ago because they were going to threaten to stop paying peg fees due to the fact that they said their franchise was up for renewal and it was required by us to reauthorize our ordinance to continue paying peg fees. It's kind of controversial. The language in the law is kind of unclear. Most municipalities are just reauthorizing them just so that they don't you know, have an issue with the cable companies. So that's what we're here to do today, which is to just reauthorize the PEG um, ordinance. There's no change in it. Charter and Comcast will continue to pay um, PEG fees for the next 10 years. What they've done is they've timed the, they have a 10-year franchise, and what they're saying is they need to reauthorize based on the new franchise starting. So we've worked with the county council, and we have the new authorization. Well, thank you for bringing this forward. Is there, are there any supervisors with questions on this item? I, I would just say I'm, I'm glad that we're uh, uh, keeping the, this fee, and um, it's unfortunate that our cable partners uh, are, are trying to figure out a way to not pay the fee. Right, not a surprise though in many respects. Is there anybody from the uh, community that would like to address us on this proposed ordinance? Please feel free to step forward. Welcome. Uh, hello again. Um, when I read the agenda, um, I haven't, since I don't do computer stuff, I, I, I don't know the details of this, but it would be very helpful for one thing when you have an acronym here like PIG fees to put in parentheses after it what the heck that stands for. And I would appreciate if you could elaborate a little bit more from the public what is this uh, charter agreement and um, I mean, is there a way you could make it succinct for the listening public to know about this who have not looked at the whole binder for item uh, 48? I would, I'm curious. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address us on item 48? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back uh, to the board just on that question what these fees are and a brief explanation would be great. Sure. Um, the, or the, the law that, first off, the DIVCA law was the Digital Infrastructure Video Something Act. Communi I, think, <laughs> I think Communications Act. Right, Communications Act, which was okay, when the state essentially <coughs> took away local franchises from counties and cities, and all of the cable franchises are now um, being managed by the state. To continue our public educational <laughs> and government um, services for essentially funding for community television. Those are the PEG fees that we get, which are 1%, a little bit, 1.2% of cable fees, video fees of the cable franchises that we collect is used to fund community television. Um, and when we went to the state franchise, we were required to create an ordinance to, can you, to continue collecting PEG fees from the cable companies. And it's used to fund community television. 
Thank you. Are there any other questions or a motion from the board? Well, the uh, C, by the way, is competition, oh, competition. not competition, communication. That's it. Uh, but I move approval of the recommended actions. Second. Thank you for the clarification. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, it passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Bowling, for uh, taking your time. Uh, moving on to 49 is to consider a mid-year financial update for fiscal year 2017-2018 as outlined in the memo, the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. And uh, we have attachment A from the mid-year finance report. Are we gonna combine items 49 and 50? Is that the intention? Okay, and item 50, just so uh, the community is aware, is to consider the general fund mid-year budget report as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We'll begin on item 49 with the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, chair and members of the board. I got my green button pressed. Good morning, chair. You might want to get closer to the microphone. <laughs> members of the board. Edith Driscoll, auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. The county budgeting principles outline that the county should regularly monitor budget conformity. The report on your agenda today and this presentation provides information on the status of the budget at the mid-year point of the fiscal year. This report provides an analysis of revenue and expenditure train, trends since adoption of the 2017-18 budget. Also on your agenda is a mid-year report by the CAO. That presentation will provide a broader look at the budget. Together, our two presentations will provide a comprehensive mid-year fiscal <coughs> update. The four areas I will cover today, general fund revenues, general fund expenditures, fund balance reserve, financial reports. I'm going to focus my presentation this morning on the general fund portion of the county's adopted budget. The county budget includes various elements besides the general fund. To re-familiarize yourself with the various elements of the entire county budget, a summary is presented here. This same summary is provided at the beginning of the adopted budget document. Besides the general fund, the budget includes special revenue funds and less than countywide funds. Special revenue funds are made up primarily of housing, park dedication funds, fish and game, and the road fund. Less than countywide funds are made up of library and county fire funds and expenditures. Board governed, def board governed special districts and other agencies include flood control, mosquito abatement, and park CSA 11 expenses. You'll see listed here is internal service funds. Internal service funds are expenses of the Fleet Service Center, ISD, duplicating, risk related, and public works department. Finally, enterprise funds are listed here and they include the Buena Vista Post Closure and the Davenport and Freedom Sanitation Funds. Now, we can look at the status of the general fund revenues. As of January 31st, 2018, the budgeted general fund amount has been updated to 496,695,768 million due to additional revenues approved by your board throughout the year. Looking at the data presented, you can see that the total general fund revenues received during and through January 2018 is 35.99% of the adjusted budget. That's how much we've received to date. This is less than how much we had received at this time last year. Last year we had received 42.28% of our revenues to date. Looking at the individual data lines presented here, total intergovernmental aid received through January of 2018 is 26% of the adjusted budget. This is less than this time last year where we were at 36% of the adjusted budget. These revenues traditionally lag as they are paid by on, on a reimbursement basis from the federal and state government. As you can see, intergovernmental aid is the largest revenue source in the general fund. So if that revenue source is lagging, then our total general fund revenue is lagging. You can see tax revenues is the second largest revenue source, and I'll be focusing on that next. Tax revenues received through January 2018 are at 48.72%, compared to 52% this time last year. This reduction is due in part to the completion of the sales tax in lieu program and the receipt of a one-time final payment that the county received last year. 
Also affecting tax revenues in a positive way was the rush the county experienced of taxpayers paying their second annual tax payment just before December 31st, 2017. As you have heard, the new tax law changes the threshold of deductibility of property taxes on personal income tax returns. The county did receive an increase in property tax receipts for the last three months of this year compared to the last three months of last year. For many days, my office had a steady line of citizens waiting to beat that December 31st payment deadline. My office had just opened a self-service kiosk prior to the rush, which um, provided additional service to them. Shall I delay? No, continue. All right. This next slide uh, shows the property tax delinquency rate remaining essentially the same. It's a little difficult to see the exact number, so I'll let you know that it's 2.279% this, this last year and 2.274% this year. So essentially the same between last year and this year. Higher delinquency rates create a cash flow issue for the county. However, the county eventually receives the taxes, penalties, and interest when the property is sold or brought current. Santa Cruz is on the teeter plan for apportionment of property taxes. What that means is cities and schools are, they determine how much they're going to receive and whether we receive all the taxes or not, we give them those funds. And then when property is eventually brought current, the county receives the penalties and interest to cover that difference. The chart here reflects the county's rates since fiscal year 2005 and 6. To provide an overview of the tax of the rates prior to and after the Great Recession, you can see there was certainly a significant difference during those years. I will use this opportunity to mention that once parcels are in the tax defaulted status for five years, meaning they haven't paid their taxes for five years, the county goes through a process to auction the properties off to recoup taxes, penalties, interest, and costs. Our next auction is scheduled for this Friday, March 2nd, 2018. We currently have 11 properties remaining to be auctioned from what we had started with 100 properties at the beginning of this year. That means 100 properties have brought their taxes current, bringing in all that property tax penalties and interest, which is always a boost to our county general fund. The next slide provides you with information on the county's interest rate earnings. My fiduciary responsibility as the county treasurer when investing funds for the treasury pool is to look first at safety, then liquidity, and then yield. With that said, the county's interest rate that the pool earns has been increasing over the last six quarters. At the end of the first quarter of 1617, our interest apportionment rate was 0.77 and the rate at the end of the second quarter of 2017-18 was up to 1.018%. And most recently, at the end of January, our apportionment rate was 1.25%. This provides for higher interest earnings for all pool members, including the general fund. The pool is made up of various entities who are required to keep funds in the county treasury. The pool reached a billion dollars in 2017. However, less than 50% of that balance are funds that are county funds. Other funds might be from fire districts or school districts. Looking at the general fund revenues for transient occupancy tax. An indicator of our local economy is the treasure, transit occupancy tax collections. For this seven month period, the county collections are ahead slightly over this time last year. We have collected $84,000 more this year than compared to last year. This information is available on the Treasurer Tax Collector's website in an easy to read chart that staff updates every quarter. Now switching to our other interesting tax, cannabis business tax. This is the only business tax the county has. $3.75 million in cannabis-related tax is anticipated to be collected by my Treasury staff in 2017-18. The county tracks this revenue via two different categories. The budget for the first revenue county, excuse me, revenue category, was increased slightly over the prior year, and 51% of that revenue has already been received. This amount collected, which reflects sales through December 31st, 2017, is due to the county at the end of the following month, so it's always a month behind. The second cannabis revenue type that's tracked is for the new type with cultivators and manufacturers. Uh, the revenue budget is 1,186, 
as of January 31, 2018, the revenue received was 63% of that money. This information is also available on the county treasurer tax collector's website in an easy to read quarterly updated chart. Now, leaving revenues and reporting our expenditures. The table you see reflects the expenditures for the first seven months of the year compared to budget. Salaries and benefits is the largest budgeted expense category the county has. And we have reached 56.8% of salaries and benefits expenses through the end of January. This is a reasonable point to be at at this point in the fiscal year. General fund, excuse me, fund balance reserves. Leaving revenues and expenditures, the next area to review is fund balance reserves. Your board revised the fund balance policy in November 2014 to increase the minimum fund balance of the general fund from 7 to 10 percent over the next seven years. The county is doing well in reaching and maintaining that goal. The committed and assigned fund balance designations of the county's general fund as of June 30th, 2017 were at 10.33 percent and they are budgeted this year at 9.97 percent for the fiscal year 17-18. It is essential that governments maintain adequate levels of fund balance to mitigate current and future risks such as revenue shortfalls and unanticipated expenditures. Fund balance levels are also critical considerations in long-term financial planning. I traditionally provide additional information on the long-term information uh, in June at budget hearings. Now, giving you an opportunity to look at the specifics of our fund balance reserves. The specific breakdown of the general fund reserve is presented here. The first two columns on the left provide the final numbers after all year-end CAFR adjustments are made. The third column is the budgeted column for 17-18 on the right-hand column, right-hand side. Um, a 10 percent reserve budgeted for this current fiscal year um, appears to be reasonable to be able to be reached. The Auditor Controller's Office continues to focus on transparency and has made EasyGov, a software, available for the public use to review financial information. You've heard me point out various elements of that information as I've pre presented this information today. EasyGov is an online financial search tool located on my website. This tool allows for easy access to information on Santa Cruz County funds and how they are budgeted and spent. The current financial data is updated at the close of each fiscal quarter for easy comparison to previous years. In addition, the county's annual financial reports and the CAO's budget documents are available online on both of our websites. In summary, general fund revenues are at 35.99% of budget and expenditures are at 51.9% of budget. Current year expenditures are as expected at this point in the fiscal year, although revenues traditionally lag behind. Both revenues and expenditures are similar to last year at this seven month point. Property tax delinquencies remain stable and interest rate earnings are on the rise. The county is on target to meet its 10% fund balance reserve goal this year. This ends my presentation. I'm available for questions. If not, I request that you accept this report. Are there questions from board members on this? Supervisor Caput. Okay. Yeah, I want to uh, show a little bit of a human aspect to collecting on property taxes and your help with your office. Uh, one of uh, one property was in delinquency of four and over four and a half years, and uh, the father died, and then the children uh, inherited the property, but they didn't know about the uh, the four to five years of tax owed, and uh, it was di very difficult contacting the family, but when they were contacted, they uh, came up with the past taxes of 30,000, I believe? Yes. And uh, that included penalties and all that. Yes. So um, that's only one, but it was, uh, that, that, hap that family is, uh, is happy right now that they didn't lose the property. So, and the other I would have would be, uh, how are we doing? I know we're we're balancing everything right now, <clears throat> but with future obligations for pensions, uh, what is it going to look like? Do we know? Uh, 
uh, yeah, you know, I, I like five, de- ten years from now. I'll delay that question. It's going to be covered in the next presentation in just fine. a moment. Okay. Supervisor McPherson. I just want to um, thank and congratulate um, everybody involved in our financial um, uh, issues that we have here in the county throughout, about, especially about the reserve account. I can't tell you how important that is that we we reach that 10% threshold. Um, we, we saw that when the storm season, uh, these un, unexpected expenditures that have to be made, um, and some other issues that are unforeseen at this point. So I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you that has been uh, uh, participating in this effort to get us up to 10%. I think it's uh, it's going to really pay dividends literally for us when we meet our f- next downturn or our next uh, natural disaster that's going to be coming probably sometime in the future. So thank you again for that. I do, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the pension issue that I'll talk about, and but one issue on um, Cal Fire, County Fire, that I'm really concerned about is that, uh, especially in light of the, the disastrous fires that we've had throughout the state, I'm, I'm really want to see, I, th- I think we're just about running on uh, fumes uh, in that, uh, for that agency, and I'm really concerned about it. The position that we're in, should that be come a little later too, or maybe I should ask that in the... Uh, well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. let that be covered in the next presentation. Uh, that's a big concern of, I think, all of ours, especially in light of the CAL FIRE that we had here this last year. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask just two brief questions. The, the two and a half percent or so delinquency rate that we're currently at, uh, I was trying to kind of normalize that across time. Is that an average rate, would you say, two, between 25 and 3% on a property tax delinquency rate? Well, the chart speaks for itself. You can see historically it has certainly been at many different levels. All I can say is in these last two years, that's where we have floated around. But if you look at the chart back on... Uh, the property tax delinquency rate. I can go back to that chart if you'd like. Well, I saw, I mean, obviously during the height of the Great Recession was an outlier. That's why I was asking kind of from a historic norm, can we expect in general that the county would have, say, a three-ish percent property tax delinquency rate? That would be desirable. This actually okay. is 11, you know, when you look at it, this is actually a 10, 11 year chart. So we can provide more information, but I was trying to just give a realistic, you know, in recent history um, reflection of where we are. You'll notice in 5 6, we were floating about below 2%. So that's even more desirable. So between 2 to 3% is. Okay. Is the goal. How about that? Is would the be goal. a target. Okay. Yeah. And then a follow-up question is, you mentioned that, that the, obviously the higher interest rates lead to greater returns, but it also leads to increased borrowing costs for the county moving forward, would it not? Yes. Yeah, not, obviously not with the interest earned in the pool. That are, those are our, but yes, that's the balance. We'll earn more, but when we look at going out for the TRAN in April, that is something we have to be aware of is how much our TRAN, for example, that will be our next item, will be. Thank, and thank you for the presentation. By the way, we're going to combine these two items together, so we'll vote to accept them both at, at once. Thank Supervisor uh, Leopold and Supervisor Coonery. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think um, that while we will have increased costs, of, because of the work that we've all done about increasing reserves and our greater um, credit rating, hopefully that uh, uh, might ameliorate some of the additional Correct. costs, uh, for at least for this year. I would like to say we might have additional costs. Yeah. The other question, just following up on the chair's uh, comments, is as we look at in California, what would the be delinquency rate of other counties? I don't know. I can certainly find out and maybe include that when I Good speak question. to you again in June for That'd the budget presentation. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, that, actually that was my question, which is I'd be interested in how we look compared to comparable counties. So, you know, whether it's San Mateo, Marin, Santa Barbara, Monterey, mm-hmm. Monterey uh, so that, because I think there probably is a pretty big variance across the state, but at least for Copper counties, for some of these metrics that you think um, that we that we sort of use to steer our financial ship, understanding how we look versus other counties mm-hmm. would be helpful. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Palacios, for your presentation. Then we'll open it up for the community to comment on both the items. Uh, 
Chair Friend and members of the Board of Supervisors, Carlos Palacios, uh, County Administrative Officer. Uh, I would also like to say I've brought with me Christina Mowry, who's our Deputy uh, County Administrative Officer and who's in charge of the de development of our budget. And she's been very, very hard at work in these last few months uh, and does a great job in uh, really helping the county to, uh, to balance its budget every year. Um, so thank you, Christina, for your leadership and your hard work. I, she's here uh, weekends and late nights during this time of year, so she's pulling the all-nighters, so to speak. And I'd also like to thank our analysts, CAO analysts, who are also uh, working very hard, and our uh, county department heads and county fiscal staff. They've all been working very hard on the budget this year. And, and overall, um, I will say that we have pretty good news for the, both this fiscal year and next fiscal year in the, in the sense that we are um, pretty close to having a balanced budget um, and without um, having to make too many uh, sacrifices. So I think that's really good news. Um, this presentation today is the mid-year budget report, and it's one we have traditionally done in years past. It's a follow-up to the report we did on December 5th. And December 5th, we did a preliminary budget projection, and at that point, we had good closing data from the prior fiscal year, so that, and some very preliminary data on 17-18. On and so we gave you that information at this point. Today we have uh, also good information on the current year's budget, 1718. Uh, the departments have estimated their um, end of year uh, balances. So we have all the department estimates in for six months and they've get, provided very good estimates for the year end. And we also have six months of data in on our sales tax, property tax and other important revenue sources. So that's why we wanted to give you this today. Um, the other thing is, I will tell you that our report uh, focuses in on the general fund. The entire budget, as um, you saw from the prior slides, is over is almost uh, three quarters of a billion dollars now. If you look at everything that the county uh, spends, that's a very big budget. Uh, the the general fund budget is about half a million dollars of that. So we tend to focus in on that. And then when we really want to focus in, we focus in on what we call a net county cost, which is the amount of money that's not supported by subventions or grants or intergovernmental revenues that's really supported by our general purpose taxes, and that's about $130 million approximately. This is the agenda today. Uh, we're going to look at the state uh, budget, um, the general economic outlook, and then the general fund as I mentioned, and then we would be uh, focusing on what's ahead for us. Uh, looking at the state budget, it's pretty much good news. Um, the state is doing actually very well, is running uh, surpluses right now, um, which you know we haven't heard from. We've had a number of years of surpluses in the state budget. The governor's uh, managing the budget very conservatively. He has focused on um, the rainy day fund, He's also focused on funding schools. He did some initiatives in infrastructure, but all in all, it's a fairly conservative budget and he is leaving his term uh, with having funded the rainy day um, budget, which he had set out as a goal many years ago. And, and that's good news from the state's perspective, I think. Um, and from our perspective, it also, for the most part, is uh, good news in terms of the state's impact on our budget. If you look at the economic outlook, um, again, pretty much good news. Um, slow but steady growth, I think, has been characterized. Um, the, re the recovery from the Great Recession, and it's the same. We are seeing uh, unemployment really at what we'd, we'd call full employment, basically about 5% in the state. That's about as good as it gets for the state of California. And we've traditionally been somewhat higher than the rest of the country. And most people would say this is full employment and uh, Santa Cruz County is also at um, lows that we haven't seen since before the Great Recession in terms of our unemployment rates as well. So all in all, in, in one sense, we're doing very well in terms of employment growth. Um, we had also pointed out that the inflation rate this year, I just saw some data that shows inflation is now running at about 2%. 
um, which is the highest it's been since before the Great Recession as well. We've had very, almost um, no inflation or very low inflation for the last five, six years. First time we're up now to about 2%, which is also mirrored by the salary increases, what we're seeing in the state as well, about 2%. So we're, again, seeing very good uh, steady growth, but with the worrisome is the growing um, inflation rate, which could be pose problems. And the other issue, of course, that are facing the state is the growing inequality issues and the growing affordable housing issues as well. If you look at our general fund for the current fiscal year, the one we're in now, so that's 2017, 2018, um, our revenues are doing slightly better, about two and a half million dollars above projections. That's actually uh, right on the button, right? If you look at a percentage, uh, it's, um, it's basically as good as you can get for projections. Um, our expenditures, however, are slightly higher, also by almost the same amount. Um, the expenditures are growing, uh, as we'll see a little bit um, later in the projection, in the presentation, um, due to some loss of some state uh, grant funding and also to some state funding not keeping pace with our local increases in, in expenditures. So most of our, our expenditure growth, again, is due to uh, our interaction with the state. Some grants ending and some expenditures that we're experiencing um, that are growing, but the state reimbursements are not keeping pace with that growth, primarily in public safety. Uh, we are expecting a fund balance of about five and five point four million dollars in this fiscal year um, to carry forward. That's about average for us. Um, that's about um, both salary savings, uh, expenditure reversions, um, and it's a healthy amount. It's not a lot. It's not too little. It's about what we'd consider average. So if you look at um, the whole general fund budget um, in 2017-18, again, what it shows is that um, our total financing uh, is growing up again by about two and a half million expenditures, um, a little bit above um, projections, primarily in public safety, primarily loss of state grants. Uh, one of the areas that we're not keeping pace is in the courts. The reimbursements we receive for security at courts have basically been stagnant, and we are seeing increase in costs just due to salary and benefit growth. And so that's one of the issues that we're seeing is, and some grants have just uh, timed out as well, in public safety in particular. So what it shows is that uh, overall, uh, we're pretty much balanced in this fiscal year, and we're uh, estimating a fund balance of about 5.4 million to carry over into the next fiscal year. Uh, now going into the, the next fiscal year, um, we're seeing, again, steady but slow growth, primarily in um, taxes. The tow taxes that are producing most of our growth is property tax, which continues to grow at a pretty healthy amount, and TOT, our hotel tax, the transient occup occupancy tax, also is showing very healthy growth. Um, Expenditures are slightly higher, again, um, as I mentioned, due to some uh, issues in public safety primarily. Um, the contingency reduction is really not something to be too concerned about. We carried some amounts in contingency in the 17-18 budget, which we're building into the base in 18-19. So some of the salary benefit increases, because we were in the middle of negotiations, we carried them in contingencies. And then in 18-19, we built them into the base. So some of that increase that you see, uh, that 11.4 million, has to do with m money moving from contingencies to the base budgets. Uh, reserves are going to continue. We think we can fund reserves to continue to 10%. And our preliminary right now, um, we're showing a very modest budget shortfall um, at the present time of $2.3 million. We intend to close that. By the time we come to you um, with our preliminary budget in May, we will have closed um, that uh, small deficit. This is the preliminary 2018-19. Um, budget uh, for revenues. Um, this is our preliminary uh, tax revenue budget. And you can see this is what funds our net county costs, so to speak. Uh, it's about $130 million. You can see that we're seeing growth of almost $6 million. That's what we're projecting. Most of it in property tax. Again, property tax still cruising along 
uh, between three and four percent of increases. How long that can continue, we all know that it can't continue forever, but it is still continuing. Uh, sales tax seeing some modest growth, but our sales tax per capita is relatively low. Just to give you an example, um, that sales tax is about is similar to the city of Santa Cruz's sales tax, and they have about half of our population. Their population is about 60,000 people. We're providing services for 135,000 people. Uh, they pretty much get about the same sales tax as we do. So, uh, on a per capita basis, we're about half uh, in sales tax. Uh, on our TOT, we're seeing a healthy growth, 16% growth. Again, the economy is just doing well in terms of the tourism industry. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is that in the cannabis business tax, we not only project that we're going to meet our budget in the current fiscal year, but we d are seeing uh, projecting a slight increase in next year's budget of about 6% almost a quarter of a million dollars of increase, up to almost $4 million uh, in cannabis business tax. Remember when we first started this, we were about a million and a half dollars, and now we're up to about $4 million. It's becoming an important um, part of our general purpose revenues. Uh, this is the actual preliminary budget for 1819. Um, and you can see that there's some slight um, revenue growth. The revenue is growing by about $5.8 million. Um, the net expenditures, if you go down to where it says $6.8 million, uh, that's really the net increase of our uh, budget when you uh, take out the contingency amount. So we're seeing a slight uh, increase in our expenditures above what our growth in revenues are, by about a million dollars. Uh, but it's very close. I mean, the, you know, we're talking about a uh, $140 million, you know, so we're less than a couple percent, you know, less than a percent really differences. So in general, our expenditures in the budget year are matching our revenue growth, which is really good news. That's what you want, right? Our ongoing expenditures meeting our ongoing revenues. We have a very short, uh, small shortfall of about $2.3 million. We're going to be working with departments in this, um, next few months to bridge that gap and we will be presenting a ba balanced budget uh, to the board when we come to you in May. So looking forward, um, our budget shortfalls, um, when you go out, out and do a five-year projection, that's where we start getting a little bit more concerned. And it has to do mainly with um, our uh, cost of benefits uh, outpacing our revenue growth. And what we will show in the next slide is that we are projecting uh, under the best case scenario of somewhere around seven to ten, ten million dollar budget gap that we would have to to fill in the future. Um, and if we hit a recession, uh, that gap could grow to ten to fifteen million dollars. Um, the best case scenario assumes that revenues continue to grow at about four percent a year. So we're continuing to add to our revenue. That's what we're assuming. We're also assuming that we continue having a fund balance. And fund balance is primarily driven, again, by uh, salary uh, savings and budget reversions. And during a recession, what the first thing you see is that fund balance um, goes to zero because people start stop leaving their jobs. So you don't have salary savings and you don't have the reversions that you normally would expect. So. Um, there is some concern as we look forward. Uh, this would be a projection of budgets. The, the yellow line is sort of the, the best case scenario. That's assuming no recession, assuming that we don't, um, that we have our traditional five to six million dollar fund balance, assuming revenues continue to grow at approximately 4%. Assuming all of our other benefit costs grow at um, what we would consider traditional rates, the one Outlier here is the PERS costs, which are just increasing very significantly. And so what it shows is that 2018-19, we have this $2 million deficit, which we will, we, will get, we will close that gap. But it shows in 2019 is when it starts to hit these, um, these major PERS increases. And potentially, you could have a deficit uh, approaching 9 to $10 million under the best case scenario in the 1920 budget year. Um, and then over time, that budget deficit uh, decreases. 
uh, and you can see that over time it goes down to about $2 million. So the first few years, 1920 and 2021, are the first years in which the PERS rate increases hit us the most severely. And again, it's not just us, this is statewide, this is the state government, this is every school district, every um, county, every city who's a member of PERS. And so that's the concern as we go forward, um, is just how we're gonna bridge that gap. Um, this is the PERS uh, general fund retirement costs. Um, you can see that uh, it's increasing from approximately $30 uh, million to almost doubling to over $60 million. Um, that's the, the total uh, general fund costs increase. If you were to take the, um, the net county cost portion of that, um, so the increase is about $28 million over that time period, the, total, the general fund cost. If you were to take the, the net county cost portion of that, it's about half of that. So it'd be about $14 million of just the general fund. So you can see that that is what's driving the cost increases. So even though our deficit is showing about 10, nine to $10 million, our PERS increases are increasing by $14 million. We're closing that gap partly through revenue growth, right? And we're projecting continuing revenue growth. But even with revenue growth, you still have this gap of approximately $14 million of PERS increased costs that we will have to, um, to gap and to, to close the gap. And you can see that um, the causes for PERS increasing, there's a number of causes. Uh, one of them has to do with the, the PERS investment rate. Um, they were a few years ago at 7.75 as their PERS investment rate that they were earning and the money we give them, they invest it and they now are down to 7%. Um, and they, there's some people that think they ought to be really at 6%. But uh, even with the reduction from 7.75 to 7%, that increases our costs, right? So that's one issue. Second issue is changing demographics. We're just living longer. Uh, so they've added another year of longevity to our PERS retiree projection. They're about to add another year. Uh, the projection is that over time, um, right now there's about six current employees per one retiree. There's, they project that within 30 years, somewhere around 30 years from now, that it'll be a one-to-one -one match, one retiree per one um, per active member. So demographics is another issue driving it. And then a, a third issue has to do uh, with the amortization of the Great uh, Recession, the losses during the Great Recession. PERS lost about $100 billion uh, during the Great Recession. And uh, if they had tried to pass that on to us all at once, of course, we wouldn't have been able to sustain it. So they uh, funded that over a 30-year period, and then uh, now they've decided to reduce that uh, amortization of that loss to a 20-year period. So it's like you refinanced your mortgage from 30 years to 20 years, it goes up. So that's another one of the major causes um, of problems for the, the PERS, PERS increases. So in terms of you know, how we are dealing with these cost increases and the challenges that are ahead of us, is the good thing is that we have time. We have another uh, fiscal year to start getting ready for what we know are gonna be um, major cost increases. Uh, we are in the middle of doing a strategic plan. You're about to hear a pre presentation on that. That'll help guide our priorities. Um, part of the strategic planning process is that next year we will be embarking on an on operations plan. An operations plan is um, more specific actual projects that link the strategic plan goals to the budget. So it's sort of that link is called the operations plan. We will be doing that next fiscal year. Um, and then we will be next year also embarking on a two-year budget. So next year we're anticipating starting our first two-year budget. So we'll have multi-year strategic plan, two-year operations plan, which will be linked to a two-year budget. And that will give us the ability to hopefully do a little bit more long-term planning about our goals. But you can see it's gonna be a, a very difficult two-year budget, right? Because those are the two biggest years of cost increases for PERS. We are embarking on a continuous process improvement effort to improve our efficiencies in um, government. We already have some departments that are doing this uh, right now. You saw a presentation today on the planning department. Um, Human Services Department has uh, been a leader in this. Our probation department is taking on an initiative in this area as well. Uh, so we're gonna be making it more systematic, more countywide. Um, Elisa Benson, our new um, assistant county administrative officer is overseeing that effort and she'll be doing some pilot projects in this next fiscal year. 
performance measures uh, will flow from our strategic planning process. Uh, we're anticipating doing some trial projects in this over the next two years in terms of how we measure the performance of our various initiatives. Uh, Nicole Coburn, who's the ass other assistant county administrative officer, is overseeing both the strategic plan and our performance measures initiatives. Um, we are determined to maintain our reserves and we thank you for your support in doing that and you've uh, shown a great deal of leadership in establishing that 10% reserve and now that we've achieved that goal, we wanna make sure and maintain it. Uh, we also want to look at revenue options uh, in the next coming year um, to try and preserve our, our most important core, core services as we enter into uh, what are some potentially difficult financial times. Uh, one option would be a uh, sales tax. Uh, this is an option that's relatively new for counties. Counties didn't used to be able to do this until a few years ago and our, one of our legislators, I think um, Mark, Stone. Mark Stone was one of the, was the uh, main person who pushed this uh, alternative for counties. And so thank you um, to our uh, local legislators for supporting this measure. We're currently at eight and a half percent of our um, at, a, at our sales tax rate. We're actually the lowest in the county. Uh, the other cities, as you can see, Santa Cruz, Capitola, and Scotts Valley at, are all at 9% right now. Uh, city of Watsonville is actually at nine and a quarter. So if we were to consider at some point raising our sales tax by half a cent, uh, that could potentially raise somewhere between 5.5 to $6 million, um, which again, we're um, looking at just different options and that certainly would be one option we'd wanna think about. Uh, other uh, possibilities, the transient occupancy tax, this is the hotel tax. Um, right now it's at 11%. If we raise it by 1% to 12, that would bring in $800,000. We have a fee that's a legacy fee of that we charge to on phones uh, that generates funds that help to cover our 911 costs. If we were to increase that to cover the actual costs of our 911 costs, we could raise potentially $800,000 there. Um, CSA 11, which funds part of our parks and recreation costs, if we were to increase it in order to cov cover half of the, the net county costs for parks and recreation, that could potentially raise about $2 million. Um, those are all options that we want to explore in the next year as we do our planning for the future, and that concludes uh, my presentation. Are there questions of the CAO before we open it up to the community? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for both presentations. I think it, it provides a good uh, picture of where we are and uh, uh, both uh, the, the strategies that we've employed to have us be in a good financial situation now and uh, it prepares us for having to make important decisions to think about how we um, deal with uh, additional needs in the future. Uh, I had a question uh, about a couple different things. In uh, Mr. Palacios, in the presentation you made where you talked about TOT going up, um, we haven't really built a lot of new hotels. Um, and so I'm wondering, do we know sort of what, uh, whether that increase is related to the vacation rental uh, work that, that we've done to, to try to uh, get that into the system? Maybe that's uh, Ms. Driscoll. Yeah, I can answer that. I would say yes, significantly. Um, the county has used different methods to uh, locate those units, what I would call an illegal unit. They're not um, certified, they're not paying a TOT tax. This past year, the, I think it's on today's agenda actually, the county is entering into a contract with Host Compliance, a company that will uh, use web resources to uh, search the web and look for additional uh, rentals. We've been doing uh, various modes throughout this past year with our audit staff to uh, continually uh, locate and reach out with those people and help them realize that they owe back taxes as well as current taxes. And now that we are gonna be having a permit for the hosted rentals, do we expect that we will see a bump there as well? I mean, I, I have no idea what the whether those are currently contributing towards it or not. I don't anticipate much of a bump. Okay. But I don't I don't anticipate a large population in that area. But I don't have the the data that CAO's office may have. It's not where your biggest dollar amount is. Okay. Your biggest dollar amount is in larger vacation rentals. Yeah, the homes. Um, the other question I had, uh, just for clarification. 
was uh, when you describe the increased retirement cost, you talked about the general fund portion of the retirement cost. And I wonder, just for clarification sense, whether you could talk a little bit more about that, because at least as, as um, I would understand is that uh, some of that cost is picked up by grants and other uh, pieces. Uh, so although it's a $28 million increase that is projected, it would only be $14 million of, of actual cost. Um, but, I, but I just thought it, clarity there would be helpful. Yes, the, um, the total general fund cost increase that we're projecting is, is about $28 million. Um, as you mentioned, some of that costs are um, picked up through grants and other subventions from other state and federal funds. And so approximately half of the general fund, uh, so if you look at the total general fund, about $500 million, about half of that is subvented in some way. So um, that $28 million then becomes about the net county cost portion, about $14 million, which would be the amount we would have to fund ourselves. And, and also, just one other point I, I just want to make uh, about retirement costs. The, the county actually took action several years back about uh, change, making changes to our, our pension system, two-tier system, uh, and also our retiree uh, uh, health uh, plan uh, policy that which saved us a lot of money. Um, and so these, ch these changes that are happening, these increased costs, are not through actions of ours. It's not through... Um, generous decisions that we've made. The, this is uh, through the PERS, the state agency, and the way in which they've managed their investments. And that was years in which they didn't actually take money from uh, from public agencies uh, at the big, uh, you know, in the early uh, 2000s. Um, and then when the Great Recession hit, they took that huge loss that we'll all be paying for for a long time. Um, I think it's important to note because, you know, I think it's a great accomplishment of this board to have built up our reserves, uh, basically triple the reserves, and we set a seven-year schedule, and because of the work that uh, with the, the CAO's office and the Auditor Controller Treasurer Tax Collector, we did it in, in four, which I think is, is, a, is a sign of the commitment we have to securing a, a good financial base. Um, so I think we have the, they have the commitment from the board to tackle these new issues, and I appreciate looking out um, uh, uh, at what might be possible sources in the future, and I do think our strategic plan not only helps us set the guide, but it also builds the, um, the buy-in from the community that we're working on the things that are most important to the community. So thanks for the work. Supervisor Caput. You answered uh, quite a few of the questions I actually was going to ask, so that'll be fine. But uh, uh, when we're talking about inflation and when we're talking about also taxes and everything, uh, inflation, uh, if the cost of goods stayed about the same, uh, that, that would be very good. But in the Santa Cruz County, we're talking about rising uh, cost of uh, buying a house. Uh, rising rents, and that is uh, really affecting, you know, basically the middle class and the lower middle class a lot. Of course, low-income families are also being pushed to the limit. So we could have low inflation as far as goods and services, but what about the cost of uh, actually having a roof over your head? So uh, uh, what, what, what can we do about that as far as uh, uh, making sure that we don't have uh, an upper class and a lower uh, wage class uh, living in the county? I know that the, um, the loss of um, um, affordable housing and uh, single residence occupancy housing has been one of the stories that has driven costs across the Bay Area. Um, if you look at Watsonville, you're very familiar. You have the Wall Street Inn and the Resitar Inn and the Stag Hotel, all that are SROs that you could, it used to be able to rent um, a room for $350 a month. And now you can still live there and still be on Social Security 
uh, SDI basically and still be able to live there. That kind of, ha kind of housing has been lost across the Bay Area and so that vulnerable populations are, are suffering and I think um, I know that the board is um, going to be talking about the um, strategic plan in the next item. I know that affordable housing is one of those big issues that has set as a goal um, for the future. I know there's talk in Sacramento uh, about reestablishing um, affordable housing redevelopment in some, uh, some manner, and there's various initiatives going now in Sacramento about affordable housing. So I think that is the key. You're right, inflation uh, in general is about 2%, but if you looked at housing inflation, it'd be you know, off the charts, you're right. And so I think uh, in Sacramento, that's certainly uh, one of the big topics of discussion right now about uh, new opportunities for affordable housing. Right, and then uh, sales tax, I guess, uh, who does that affect uh, the most? Uh, I mean, if somebody has a big wage and they, they make a lot of money, they don't care too much about a half a cent tax uh, in the sales tax going up, or three quarters of a percent when you add them together, or one percent if you add everything together. Uh, that does affect the uh, lower income families a lot because they buy, they have to buy clothes, they have to buy diapers, they have to buy um, laundry soap, they have to buy uh, all the goods that everybody has to and so that, that adds up too. And then of course that affects the senior citizens, uh, a lot of them on fixed income or maybe only social security. So uh, when we're talking about tax, state money coming in and, uh, and everything, we're talking about taxpayer money. Taxpayer money's paying all of this. So. Uh, I didn't, I might have missed it. I did see state, uh, you know, in pretty good shape. But what about federal tax money coming into the county? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Yeah. And um, that's, um, we have some uh, new funding coming in that you're aware of through, for example, Drug Medi-Cal is a new program that ultimately comes from the state, I mean, from the feds through the state. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty about the federal budget and the impact it could have on us. And that's going to be part of the thing I think we're going to have to live with for the next few years is a lot of uncertainty in regard to the, the federal budget. The, the, the president's uh, federal budget that he proposed contained major, major cuts to the safety net programs which we administer. And um, so who knows what's going to happen with that. That's true. And uh, lastly, uh, when we're talking about future pensions and retirement for all county workers, uh, uh, we all see uh, Social Security statements that come maybe once a year or whatever, and it says that if the current way that things are going, Social Security is going to only be able to pay so much. I'm thinking, are we only going to be able to pay so much on our obligations in the future on pensions? Is there going to be something that we're going to be sending out every year? Uh, I know you answered part of that, but are we doing enough to make sure that maybe we'll be okay, but the people that are hired after us or elected after us will not actually only be getting 75% of what they were promised instead of 100%? Um, I think PERS is actually uh, doing much needed reforms right now that they probably should have been doing years ago. So they're actually stabilizing their system. They should have probably done some of these things years ago. So I think uh, ultimately PERS will be more stable, um, but it's going to be very difficult for in the next seven years for local agencies to, to have to um, increase our funding. Uh, in the end, I think it'll be a much more stable system. There, I don't think anybody's arguing that these reforms that PERS is doing, that they don't make sense at some level. The question is the timing of them, the amount of them, and should they have been doing them earlier? Um, for example, the, the discount rate. You know, that's, they've had issues with that for many, many years, and they're finally taking action. It's probably the right thing to do. Probably make the system better in the end. So I think in the end the system is going to be better, but it's going to be difficult in the next five to seven years to for local agencies to absorb those cost increases. I, I, I hope you're right. I, you know, I I think the same way on that. But uh, they did lower. What's what's the effect of uh, 7.1 or they went down to seven percent? 
Yeah, their investment rate went from 7.75 and then it went to 7.5 and now it's at 7%. So that, that, that's not good, right? Well, it's more realistic. It's more realistic to what they're actually earning. And so in that sense, it's good, it, you know, because it's more realistic. It's not good in the sense that it raises our cost at the local level to contribute to make up for that amount of money. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson, before we open it up. Yeah, um, this looks like a good, year, a good news for a couple of years and then uh, very um, questionable for uh, three years and out. Um, I just want to, again, commend everyone involved for uh, allowing us to build up a reserve to 10% and with the warning that uh, in the years coming there's going to be a lot of pressure to dip into that for all kinds of purposes and we have to be really be careful of how we manage that because uh, we have to be ready for those uncertain times. Uh, we, I really appreciate your, your for, seeing the forecast and um, I just um, would like to amount, you know, to make a announcement to PERS to get real. And if they could just get real and say their investment portfolio was probably in the five or six percent level, that'd be realistic maybe. Um, I, I don't know, it's, these things are out of our control really, but I hope that this county and all local governments can put a lot of pressure on uh, PERS to, to get real with their anticipated uh, income structure, shall we say. Um, that's something that we don't, we don't control and it has a tremendous impact on what we do or what we can do. Um, I, I, I think, and I, I've read um, the forecasts of many cities in the next year or two going bankrupt and counties probably too. And we're not in that position, but uh, um, I, I think that is a starting point if we could get them to, to get real and get a statewide effort to have them address that in a forthright manner, it would be very valuable to all of us. Um, in your, the, um, the fund balance, you see a carryover of 5.4 million and then in the preliminary budget uh, for a $2.3 uh, million dollar shortfall. And I guess that's anticipation of having all those positions filled and so forth and if they are, and, uh, expenses are going up a little faster than revenues. Uh, that's the reason for that. We could, if those positions in the next fiscal year were not filled, we'd, we'd also have some opportunity for carryover as well. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. Okay. And, yeah, and that's, we will close that gap before, you know, we will bring you a balanced budget. Yeah, okay, that, and that's, uh, to your credit, I really appreciate that very much. Um, and I, um, well, I'll get into maybe some specifics a little later, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. We'll now open it up to the community. If members for opportunity for members of the community to address us on, these, on this uh, combined budget item. This is not an action item other than just to accept and file the report, but we welcome the input. Uh, good morning and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, detailed report. It doesn't look good to me. Um, you say there's a lot of uncertainty about the federal budget and cuts to the safety nets. And that was reflected just recently when this uh, tax change was voted upon um, that will make the upper class and the corporations even wealthier and the poor people worse off than ever when they changed the tax for the corporations from 35% to 20%. This only benefits the, the rich. And I can't help but thinking of that bumper sticker I had on my car for years as a teacher. It will be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. They've just, and the military budget was just gargantuan, and of course that's siphoning out money from what could be used in uh, counties and cities. Uh, Mr. McPherson, you say we have to be careful how uh, we manage money, this is true, and you hope local counties can put pressure on PERS. Um, and it looks like bankruptcy is in the forecast. What I'd like to see is local counties and cities demanding that this topsy-turvy system where most of the money goes to the military and the wealthy is 
turned the other way around, and that the people of the community and the well-being of the community and the environment are top priority, and there should be a way that cities and towns can get together to insist that this money remain in the cities and counties to benefit people here instead of going to uh, dangerous wars abroad and, and the wealthy. So that, that's part of the context, and it says, we're living in an inequitable capitalist system. That's the foundation. And how much money can we imagine when we're fighting over the small crumbs left when most of the financial pie is going to the wrong places, mainly the military and corporate and wealthy interests? Thank you. Yeah, I want to be able to say uh, I do appreciate that report, uh, County Council, and then also the lady over here. It was really nice. I want to be able to talk about, you know, the, you, you guys, the County Board of Supervisors, as I kind of hear what you guys have to say, you guys are constantly hinting that the trying times are here, right? The leaning up or the thinning out of the herd. Um, and like I said, there's only two classes, the privileged versus the persecuted, the well-off versus the worst off, those that enjoy the prestigious economy and those that wallow in a subsistence economy. But one thing that we want to, we want to guarantee is community justice. And when we look at the, the budget, the general budget fund and the cost, and we can impose cost measuring, cost measuring uh, uh, savings um, regarding the public and justice safety is consolidating. Just like they want to consolidate my, my cases at the, at the harassment court, right? We can consolidate these three private law firms that are not accountable to the American public, right? And consolidate and make a one county civil rights uh, office where they're going to defend the rights of the people. The increase from uh, uh, 2017 to 2018 is $75.2 million. If you look at the projections for 2018 to 2019, it's 83.2, right? That's a, that's eight million dollar increase. And the equitable trade-off is, hey, it's just political shenanigans. At the at the at the harassment court, if we provide people with with aggressive legal counsel and defense, it's going to save because people are not going to be caught up in the loop. People are not going to be going to court. They're going to have an adequate defense to defend their rights from the punishing state. Because, hey, our humanity matters. Just because we don't come from a family of wild power and influence, we want community justice. Out of the 58 counties, as we go into this political apocalypse, we want one county that's gonna shine. And I would want it to be Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm gonna speak on economic development as part of what I believe, I want to say thank you as, as a senior being here for and getting this report. I'm sure we can find more online. Uh, I would ask each of you, including our community, to research the idea of co-ops and certainly what could be done regionally over in Santa Clara. It's a policy which I believe, at least uh, in the past, I was told is in our own county. People don't have to work for some outside county. They could own their own business and work in it. So I just ask you to, in saying thank you, but I've also been a salesman most of my life. And in my background, I won't say I was selling bologna, but I put ads together at the grocery store for 29 and 39 cents. So as a senior living on less than a, I, what it costs for three kids to live in a room, this is serious. And I just would hope that in the future, we find more young people filling these empty seats. But thank you for the report. Um, I'm gonna go home and try to learn more about it. Thank you for your own uh, insight, Greg. It's not just housing and rent, it's go to a grocery store. But thank you also for your support of the Gray Bears and our, our veterans, where people like me can, you know, at least not be hungry. 
So I'm honored to be here and spending the time. Look forward for the next agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. I just want to point out by combining public comment for two items, you have reduced effectively public comment to a minute and a half. So I just want to make that public. <laughs> Um, I have, uh, I noticed that the county fire issue budgeting was not discussed, and thank you, Mr. Ms. Supervisor McPherson, for bringing that up. I would like discussion on that that didn't happen. Um, I would like to uh, thank Supervisor Caput for bringing out a discussion on the true economic disparity that is uh, going on in the county and how issues may exacerbate that. I want to thank uh, Ms. Driscoll for the excellent report and for the um, uh, information about the EasyGov and all of that information that you presented being available on the website. I know there is a significant portion of the population that is, does not get on the internet and I'm wondering how we can also make that excellent information that you presented available to them. Um, if it could house some, somehow be available in libraries and um, information be put about that in availability on property tax bills. I have a question about the uh, pro tax penalty relief program. It was interesting to hear about the teeter plan and how that affects the budget and how the any disparity in paying um, the schools and fires for money they need when maybe the county hasn't been paid would come through penalties and, and fees charged to delinquent taxes. So that, that goes in, in hand in hand with um, code 4985.2 that states that uh, you can request uh, tax relief, uh, penalty relief from that. I wonder how available that information is to the public, if that could be included on people's property tax bills, that that option is available to people. Um, I want to also thank CAO Palacios uh, excellent report, that was good information. Is it available online where I could find that? I also really want to point out something in when I was reviewing this information um, earlier that I see zero in the f uh, column for capital improvements and major infrastructure repairs. And that alarmed me and I didn't see it really discussed in your graph here. Can you please discuss that too? Thank you very much. Is there anybody else from the community that would like to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll close it and bring it back to the board. Were there any additional questions from board members or some of the questions that are presented uh, from the member of the community? Do you want to just briefly address the infrastructure question? Um, yes, the um, CIP capital improvements program, most of the funding, in fact, almost all the funding is in non-general fund um, um, funds, so um, we do have a significant amount of infrastructure funding, but the great majority of it is in enterprise funds and other special funds. And this was focused mainly on the general fund. It would be good for us in the future to have general fund money going to the CIP, and that's one of our goals, I think, in the strategic planning process in the future, but for unfortunately, we don't have very much funds at all going in the general fund to capital improvements. Thank you. This is an acceptance file. Yeah, I'll just, I just wanted to add a, a comment to that. I, you know, the county uh, engaged in a very uh, proactive and interesting way to fund solar improvements, which we're seeing right now outside as part of our capital infrastructure. Uh, and also to help reduce some of our costs. And because of Measure D and SB1, we're gonna be having a lot more money to put into our road infrastructure uh, than we've had uh, in the past, as well as some of even our, uh, our transit infrastructure. So um, there, there, are, there are new monies that are coming into that that aren't reflected in the general fund. I would move to accept and file both these reports and express my appreciation to the staff who put work to put them together. Motion from Leopold, a second from Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thanks for your work on putting this together. Very informative. Move on to the last item of the regular agenda, which is to cons item 51, to consider a report on the draft vision, mission, values, and focus areas for the Santa Cruz County Strategic Plan, and direct staff to return with an update on the strategic planning process on or before April 10th, 2018, as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the strategic plan methodology, the strategic plan draft 
elements, and I believe we have a presentation from the Assistant County Administrative Officer, Ms. Coburn, is that correct? That is correct. Good morning, welcome, thank you for waiting today. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant County Administrative Officer, and I'm here to present on the Vision Santa Cruz County strategic planning process. Um, I'm gonna be touching on the results from our outreach with the community and employees, as well as presenting the draft vision, mission, values, and focus areas that the steering committee has been working on. So just to remind you, um, these are the strategic plan elements that we're working towards um, in order to create the strategic plan document. There are five elements shown here. Uh, the purpose of our strategic planning process is to establish a long-term vision for the county and set a course of action through overarching focus areas and subsequently through specific goals and objectives that we'll take up as part of our operational plan. I'm gonna to be touching on the first four elements, the vision, mission, values, and focus areas today. So this slide shows our strategic planning methodology. Um, as you can see, our office has been involved in overseeing a steering committee convening their meetings. Um, the steering committee created the framework for the strategic planning process in the fall. This process has really been driven by community and employee outreach. We started off by holding employee mixers um, in late October and early in November. We had four of those and we engaged over 200 employees. We then moved into the community forums in November and we held five events, one in each district and over 200 participated in those as well. Um, lastly, we developed a community survey which we released in November and held open through the end of December. We had 2,200 responses or more than 2,200 people respond over that period. Um, the, the input that we received touched on county vision, mission, values, um, strengths and weaknesses and op opportunities and barriers. So this is um, some of the results from our strategic planning outreach. This map shows the top vision word by zip code. And as you can see, um, it highlights that affordable um, was really one of the key words that rose to the top in, in, in the South County and also North County. Um, I wanna note that although different regions prioritize different words, the same themes rose to the top. There were, there were differing in rankings between neighborhood to neighborhood, but we, we saw uh, affordability in housing rising to the top over and over again. Um, our mapping, we did some, several of these kind of maps were just to see where the different words um, were higher and South County envisioned a more inclusive, diverse and affordable community while North County residents envisioned a safer, healthier and more sustainable community. This chart, um, since survey responses uh, totaled approximately 200, they outnumbered some of our other engagement efforts. So we created a simple model to compare the results. Uh, this, in this chart, all of the words shown here are important. The chart simply shows the magnitude of the responses by weight. So you can see um, where people weighted particular words higher than others. What, what does a negative number mean? It just, it's the difference to the mean. So the negative number doesn't mean there were negative votes. It just means the magnitude of those votes was less compared to the average. So uh, for this community survey, the survey results demonstrated that a vision for Santa Cruz County is for a safe, healthy, and affordable community. And then you can see with the employees through the mixers, um, employees envisioned a collaborative, compassionate, and equitable community. Um, we think that employees may have thought of this as a vision for their workplace while the community was viewing um, the community at large in terms of um, where they live. Um, moving on to this slide, so uh, because um, we compared the, we had survey, the survey translated in both uh, in Spanish and released it in both English and Spanish. This is a similar chart that compares the results from the English and Spanish language surveys. The English responses, um, there were far more of them than the Spanish language responses. We had 32 responses in Spanish. 
We did do quite a bit of outreach, including a Facebook ad targeted at Spanish speaking areas of the county. And many of those that responded to our English language survey were from um, Spanish speaking areas. Responses to the Spanish language survey uncovered a need to address concepts of justice within the community. Uh, the vision of a healthy and educated community was also a major driver for resp respondents to the Spanish language survey. This is a word cloud that shows the top trends that emerged from the survey. As you can see, um, housing was the, cited as the top issue facing Santa Cruz County. Uh, transportation also rose to the top, as well as issues of health and safety, the economy, and the environment. Um, to identify focus areas, the steering committee broke down data around community trends, strengths, and weaknesses. Uh, we wanted to uh, point out a couple things in addition to this. Um, employees, through their engagement, also noted issues related to county operations, even though they might be, not be cited here in this word cloud. Um, in addition, um, based on the survey, women valued housing and health more than male respondents, and men valued transportation and economic factors more than um, the women. This shows three of our strategic plan draft elements, the vision, mission, and values. The steering committee took all of the data that was generated over the past six months and distilled it into these, these three draft elements. Um, they are tended to reflect all of the global input received, and the goal really is to establish a long-term vision that reflects the entire community. In the, vision, uh, the draft vision statement shown, uh, you'll see that it reflects major themes of health, safety, and affordability in our community. It also incorporates economic and environmental vibrancy, which touches on the themes of prosperity and sustainability. Lastly, it includes um, for all to address themes of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. The mission, the draft mission statement addresses both qualitative and quantitative aspects of what we do as a county. It reflects themes of accessibility and compassion, as well as efficiency and effectiveness. And it, it also supports quality of life and opportunity, which were important to all participants. And the third bubble, the values are shown. We group these by service and partnerships to provide some context. Um, while we didn't show it graphically, we found a high level of alignment between the county and employees on county values. The draft values reflect the themes of accountability, innovation, transparency, collaboration, respect, and trust. Integrity um, was a word that was voted on quite a bit by both employees and the community. Um, and it, we feel that is intertwined through many of these words. And as we move into focus groups, we'll, we'll be defining behaviors associated with values and it'll provide some additional context. Uh, the last uh, element that we wanna point out are the focus areas. This graph shows the focus areas that we've landed on. Health and safety is at the center. Um, with housing, economy, transportation, and the environment surrounding it. County operation is, is shown at the base, which supports all these areas. We provided an attachment to the agenda item that shows um, all of these focus areas and highlights some quotes from the community that we gathered either through the survey or other efforts that kind of highlight the area and also list some of the major trends within those focus areas. So, Next steps in our strategic planning process. Um, beginning in March, uh, we would hope to start holding some goal setting events within focus groups. Uh, we had a high level of interest from participants, both through the survey and through our community efforts, um, who would indicate an interest in participating in those groups. And so we'll be selecting um, those who indicated interest to participate. We hope that they would be reflective of our diverse staff in our community. We do, would be holding focus groups both internally with employees and out in the community. These events are gonna provide an opportunity to validate the vis vision and mission, um, assist in defining values and considering goals in each focus areas. 
We would then use this information to prepare the strategic plan document, which we would bring to you as a draft and um, subsequently hope to adopt by the end of the fiscal year. We would like to return with another update in April on this process, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Coburn, for that. Are there questions from board members on this? This is just an update. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to all those who participated in the survey results. And I had one email that was, um, they, they, they questioned why do we even have the employee mixers? You know, this should be the community's input to this. Well, our employees are see the problems of the day, the good things, the bad things, and the operations of the county. And I think it is very much proper that we did have, I'm, I'm so pleased to see 200, more than 200 employees uh, participate in this. And um, we really need their input as well. And I, I really want to say to the general public, though, that uh, this is very valuable for us in what we're going to do in the future. And we just saw the bud budget. Uh, limitations that we're going to be facing in the next couple of years. This is going to be a real um, important element of what we do in planning the future and the, meeting the needs of the people of Santa Cruz County. And so for those who did not, or not some of those 2,200 that were in the community survey, you still have a chance to come in and say something at these uh, focus groups. And I really encourage you to do that because this is going to be a document that is uh, we've needed for a long time, and it's going to be very valuable for us in planning the future and meeting the needs of the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I also want to express my appreciation to all the members of the staff who participated <clears throat> in this leadership uh, for Ms. Colburn uh, and the rest of the CAO staff for doing, trying to work to, to include lots of voices in this. Um, this process should be inclusionary, not exclusionary, um, <clears throat> and we often want to get information from those staff members who are on the front lines who can tell us what they're seeing in their interaction with the public, so um, uh, it makes some sense. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the question about the English-Spanish uh, results. Uh, because the, it, it was uh, interesting, fascinating, a little, uh, maybe even a little disturbing. But I, I wanted to ask the question, you talked about that there were uh, 2,200 uh, responses to the survey in English. But did I hear you right saying there were 32 responses um, to the Spanish language survey? There were, th that's correct. There were 32 responses to the Spanish language survey. Um, there were, we were looking through the English language survey and there were a large number of responses from areas where there would have been Spanish speaking. Yeah, no, uh, the reason I, I bring that up is because statistically that's, it, 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 from the look of the chart, it would give an impression that there was, uh, that, that may be a little bit out of balance. N not that the issues of the 32 people who responded in Spanish weren't important. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, we should do a better job of trying to m ensure that we have a better representation of Spanish speakers if we're gonna, if we're gonna try to, to equate what we're hearing from both English and Spanish speakers. And to that end, I think when we do the focus groups, I know we have talked about it, mm -hmm. but I wanna reinforce that we should be doing um, <laughs> Uh, a town hall or some kind of focus group in Spanish. Um, I have folks who are ready and, and willing to participate and I think that would be really helpful so th um, there can be equal weight um, uh, to the responses. And my hope is that we don't see great disparities in, in, in what people say regarding b by language. Um, but I think it would be informative if we really worked hard to ensure that those voices were included in, the, in this uh, strategic plan, because I think that'll make us, it'll make up for a better plan and it'll reflect a, 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 a more diverse element of our community. And I think that that will only make the, the final results stronger. So uh, I'm willing to help out. I just, uh, we, uh, uh, it seems like uh, last time we just didn't have enough uh, le uh, lead time to do it. Um, if we want to do something in March, uh, we need to get started on it right away. Mm -hmm. um, and it would, it would take at least a couple weeks to just pull everybody together. But I'm willing to help. So thank you for the work. Thank you. 
Supervisor Coonerty. So thank you for this. I think it's, I think we're building some great momentum. Um, I want to caution, I think I've said this before, that um, as this process goes forward, you really take time to make sure you're engaging with each one of the supervisors because I would hate for the community and the staff to feel like they create this perfect document and then we start up here starting to rewrite it and you lose some of the buy-in and momentum and I think we play a really key, key role, obviously standing between uh, the public and the, and the staff uh, in these and you know I think there are different words that I would choose for different policy objectives that I'm seeking. I'm sure my colleagues have the same. And so you're gonna have to build in this iterative process a chance for us to shape this. Now is not the time for us to wordsmith it, but I think, I think recognize that that's gonna be part of the process and so that I don't wanna create expectations where everyone, where this is sort of presented to us on a silver platter and we start rewriting it and we lose a lot of the momentum, the really good input and momentum that we've had so far. So make sure it's a truly iterative process. And briefly, uh, I attended the, the community meeting to help NAPTOS, it was, it was great. I appreciated the outreach you did. The people were really engaged and it was good to see that level uh, of engagement from the community, uh, not just in the second district, but, but the real interaction between staff and the community and to Supervisor uh, McPherson's point, because I received the same email, uh, you know, the 22 to 23, whatever, 100 employees here at the county, I mean, they, they live in our community too. So, uh, I mean, I think it's completely, you, you shouldn't view them as two separate things. We're, we're polling our employees, not just because of the great work they do in the interface, but they're, they're the ones facing transportation issues and housing issues and safety issues and everything else uh, along with the community, because they are the community. And so I think it's very reasonable that uh, we poll our own employees. Two. So I'd like to open this up uh, for the community to uh, have a discussion. This is just again on the update. Nothing is being finalized or decided today. It's just an, uh, an update. Good early afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Victorious Alexander, civil society activist. Just here in the report, I, I would like more inclusion of the immiserated population. The economically immiserated population, they need to send people to the jail. They need to send people how they're interacting with the GA office and the human service department, right? And people that are coming out of the, uh, the sheriff department. These are important people that want to uh, contribute, you know, to the values of our community, right? And in particular, interviewing me. Because I dialogue with thousands of people, right, as a civil society activist. So I know the, the issues that are plaguing the hearts and minds of the immiserated population. And when you just use functionary bureaucrats, it's a privileged point of view, you know, because they work for the system. When I come with my political uh, um, activism, a lot of these directors misconstrue and vulgarize people that would want a better political life of our community. So having a real authentic uh, uh, dialogue with members of the community, the unprotected classes need to be heard. And they should be treated fairly, and they should be included because a lot of these, a lot of these uh, functionary bureaucrats, they have their own warped ideological values that don't include people like myself. Because when they see me, they see me up to no good. And when I see them, I see them as uh, as hostile. You know, we need we need community involvement. And we need people from the threat from down below. The threat from down below is, hey, we're tired of the scam. We want healing, and healing is when you recognize the legitimacy of what is other, is you're gonna be able to say, hey, Victorious Alexander and his constituents, they matter. And we wanna be able to say, hey, th these are the demands that we're making in order for us to maintain that social harmony. And this is a great county, and you guys are great men. Just have the sensitivity to include the less of the brother. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, welcome. Thanks Hi. for waiting. Hi, I'm Colleen Douglas, and just yesterday I sent an email to you all, but I don't, sorry it was so late. But I was part of the community meeting in Live Oak. I love the process, I love what's going on. I really think the focus on words is critical because words make a difference. At the vision level, as was just uh, repeated, from the vision all the way down to performance measures, it comes from the words and the, the goals that are set. And as I was looking at the graphs that were presented online in the agenda for this meeting, I noticed differences between North and South County 
and also English speakers, Spanish speakers. And the Spanish speakers uh, issue was just talked about some, but like North County, safe, healthy, and sustainable were the highest three that I could see in these, the graph presented. And then South County, it was inclusive, diverse, and affordable. And I guess affordable was important for both of them, and I totally would agree. In the Spanish speakers, justice, healthy, supportive, educate, and opportunity were the highest to the lowest, whereas English speakers, safe, affordable, sustainable, environment, and healthy. But the selected words were healthy, safe, affordable, economy, and environment. And um, I was just heard that the for all in the vision represents the inclusive and diverse aspect of those words. But for all is never gonna be measured. It's never gonna turn into a performance measurement. And so to me, that, that really doesn't do it. If the three highest words in South County, which is not just the 32 responses in Spanish, are inclusive and diverse and affordable, inclusive and diverse have to be in there somewhere. That's why it, we need to be able to figure out how can we focus there in a way that can be measured? How can we include people effectively in our countywide strategic plan? So, and I also want to say that sustainability um, is a three pillar uh, measurement, is usually economy, environment, and social justice for the triple bottom line. And that the words for, from South County and Spanish speakers are the social justice words. And I'm not seeing them highlighted enough. Even though sustainable was presented twice from North County people, it's not just about economy and environment. So thank you so much. I'm really excited to continue to be part of the process and I appreciate the ability to speak. Thanks. Thank you. And we did all receive your email, so thank you for that. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Becky Steinbrenner and I wanna thank you for the good report. Um, I attended a couple of those meetings because I wanted to get a sense of what the different communities were like and what was what is important to them. Um, I would like to ask that these efforts be extended to all local high schools because as our gentleman here has been pointing out, we need the youth that is tomorrow to be involved now. And I would like to see this go to the high schools, to Cabrillo College, to UCSE, which maybe has more of a transient population, but a lot of those people stay, as we see on our board here today. Um, and also to the farmers markets, especially in the Watsonville area. At a time in our uh, political climate when many of them are hesitant to really uh, respond to a government agency, I think going out to the Watsonville City Plaza, which is a great um, place, and, and the people come and meet there um, outside of the supermarkets where the people come and meet and talk. Those are excellent venues to really increase the involvement of our Spanish speakers and maybe for the segments of the population that are intimidated by a government agency coming and asking them what they think. I would like to point out a difficulty that my family had in taking the online survey, and that was that um, it, the survey seemed to recognize the IP of our computer home, home computer system. So I took the survey from home, but my daughter was not able to. It said I had already registered a, a survey. So I took her to the public library so we could involve her. But that may also be reflected in some of these low response areas where there may be only one computer in the home. Um, I also want to point out that I, I saw that uh, the, the key word for the Spanish speakers was justice, and I think uh, uh, Victorious really spoke to that a lot. And I would also like to second his ideas of going out to the jails and places where uh, the, some of the disparaged communities are, but are part of our community, and, and we hope will 
um, be able to function in a different way with improved social services to be part of our community in the future. And I also want to see, say that I saw in the first slide accountability, affordable, and safe were uh, the key words, but I did not see accountability uh, repeated very often in the information um, presented in the rest of the document. So um, again, I want to thank you for your efforts and I applaud this effort in general. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, and uh, I did come here to hear what you as supervisors would put out as feedback. Most uh, thankful, John, for you pointing out the 32. I represent a vision called Grupo Amistad. I'm Richard Lewis. I want to say thanks to staff because I also got an email from your communication person. I want to speak into the process and that you as supervisors want to be before the finalized version is. We had eight years research, a design for youth development policy. There's no way in three minutes that I can transfer what I believe in. But if we move forward with the process, I want to say that we've got to include those kids currently on probation. We have to listen and see them as an asset and a resource. And we're never going to find another county as small as Santa Cruz who can put that theme under Monsdales, as some of you remember, the task force on youth employment. Please take on this theme as within your team. Look at the empty seats that used to be there and people who should be here from the community. I wouldn't be here if I didn't get an email from your communication people. So listen to the future. The hub is higher education. The strategy is lots of names, applied research, uh, action research. Please make and take advantage of our two, and it's not those only, uh, higher education institutions. And so some of you, I've had short conversations. Who knows what that idea? You can't design the future unless you listen to it. And here with the team, we have an opportunity. So I'm honored just not to have to video today, but to be part of that process that you've created, a strategic plan. And I'll learn, I see I even have a minute left. I just want to see what we can do in terms of a youth mayor in Scotts Valley, a youth mayor in Watsonville, certainly Capitola in there. So this frames what the county can do. And I know the county of, of San Francisco, one does research, we'll see they set aside a percentage of their budget to put into youth development. So I thank for being here. I'm going to close with, if I have time, 85% of our lawyers that pass the bar, they're white. We've got to come from what it is in Watsonville and Beach Flats Get that kid to finish high school. Be ready for college. Go to Cabrillo for two years and get free tuition at UC Santa Cruz. So before I die, I hope I see the results of what leadership has done in our county. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on the, this item, the Vision Santa Cruz item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. It's an acceptance file. Supervisor Leopold. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I appreciate the comments made by everyone. I think that the, the comments by Ms. Douglas are important. Um, and uh, I think uh, I would just encourage uh, the uh, committee to take a look about uh, uh, in, uh, the words inclusive and diverse, because I think that really gets at some of the issues that we've talked about. When, when my colleague talks about, uh, concerned about um, a stratified society of, uh, of upper class and lower class, um, uh, that we want to make sure that this community is inclusive of, of a diverse community, that we're not all, uh, that we don't all look the same, that we, uh, that we have places for uh, people who are working in the fields, working in the coffee shops, working in the tech jobs, trying to figure out how to capture that, uh, I think makes some sense. And I appreciate the, the comments. Um, uh, from Ms. Douglas and all the others, but uh, I think it would be important to include that. Is there a motion? Uh, I would move the recommended action to accept and file this report. 
So we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. That concludes the regular uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. We do have a closed session. Will there be anything reportable out of closed session? Yes. So there'll be something reportable out of closed session. I'd like to thank uh, Community TV and the Sentinel for being here today and all of you that participated in today's meeting. We'll now convene closed session. <laughs>